Hey, what's going on guys? I have another great guest today. My guest is a recovering addict who turned his business into $100 million business. He sold it for over hundred million la or in 2021. Uh, an incredible story where he's running from the police. He robbed drug <laughs> dealers. Uh, he's now a real estate mogul and an entrepreneurial coach. Uh, and I got to meet him in Miami. Really excited to have him out here, Mr. Eric Spofford. How you doing, Eric? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Beautiful, man. I, okay, yeah. so I'm going to tell you what my recollection of it was. So Dan's like, hey, come to brunch with me, right? Dan Fleischman, yep. who, by the way, a lot of the guests you'll see on the show come from Dan Fleischman because yep. he's sort of like the hub that all of he's the like spokes. He's like the connector of connectors. He is. He yeah, is. He's, for sure. he, yeah, it's like they say, Jay-Z is your favorite rapper's favorite rapper. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, Dan Fleischman is your favorite influencer's favorite influencer, yeah, right? Yeah, that's right. I and mean, he knows everyone. And uh, shout out to Dan. He just started uh, Money Mondays, his podcast. I see that. It's crushing he, it. He goes around in a... RV and interviews people in their front yard in yeah. his RV, which is pretty awesome. Anyway, so we're sitting at this dinner, and one of the things I noticed is that we were all kind of dressed the same. A lot of us had black t-shirts on and torn jeans, but then some of us had like $300,000 watches on, and some of us had <laughs> Apple watches on, right? That was the one thing that I noticed. I was like, hey, look at, and then and then you talk to somebody next to you, and you'd be like, oh, you know, I have, a, I have a website where we do dog, you know, we sell stuff for animals, whatever. We do about $4 million a month. I was like, wait, what? Like, that was, yeah. the conversations kept being like that. So I, you know, I ended up meeting you and I noticed the, the watch you had on. I was like, okay, there's something going on here. And then we end up getting in your Bentley and then we go to that other club. And, um, and then after that, because I knew you knew Irie and I knew you knew yep. um, Sh Shane yep. Santa Croce, right? Yep. Who's also in a similar field, isn't that correct? I don't know Shane that well. I know Irie and Dan. I think Shane is in the rehab space as well. Is I he? think he is, yeah. Got it. Uh, and, so, and so I, I do that and I was like, man, I started doing it. And then you reach out to me and I was like, hey, let's do an interview. And then so I go, I go re watch all your interviews. Man, what an incredible story. Like it really is a fascinating story. So let's start Thank from you. the beginning, man. Salem, New Hampshire. Your dad is uh, your dad's a logger. Your mom is like a traditional mom. But like a lot of people, and I want to get into this. For some reason, a lot of these northeastern cities, which are mostly like rural and a lot of Anglo kids, end up being drug havens. Yeah. Right. And and it was something that's hard because I grew up during the crack epidemic in yep. East Dallas, but it was mostly minorities, most his, Hispanic and black yeah. people. And it was mostly crack cocaine. It wasn't things like fentanyl. And I'd never seen heroin. I'd never had a friend die of heroin overdose. Yeah. So can you talk about that whole scene it during was, that time period? It was honestly the perfect, you know, the perfect storm. New Hampshire since the early 2000s has led the country on opioid abuse. Mm. Um, it's you know a rural state. There's 1.1 million people in the entire state. Uh, my town was you know small blue collar town right on the Massachusetts border, about 45 minutes north of Boston. Uh, OxyContin hit it hard in the late 90s, early 2000s. My generation was kind of the first pioneers of middle class white suburban heroin addicts. Yeah, we were like the first ones. Why do you think it is so prevalent in that part of the country? Now, you do see in rural areas in Oklahoma and Arkansas where you see methamphetamine yeah. becomes a problem. A lot of the southern cities during the 90s were hit with a crack epidemic. And yeah. one of the things, I had a, a buddy of mine, he's going to Harvard, and he's lived in both places. And he told me he believes part of the reason why some of this happened was because in the south, the, the sentences for crack cocaine were like five, ten times worse than they were for powder cocaine yeah and so you saw a lot of these kids like would go to jail and get out where in the south they'd be getting 25 years to life yeah and i don't know if you think that because i during while you were alive we had um hardcore closer in here uh yeah, and he would yeah ryan so ryan steumann was talking about Love this ryan. he was like when i was in jail is when the bush administration got rid of that law which basically gave more time for crack cocaine than well, they did that, for that was joe biden's 1994 crime bill okay where joe biden introduced it in 1994 and um essentially you know, it targeted minorities. It targeted black men, really, yeah. because that who was who was participating in the crack cocaine epidemic, mostly at the time. And the law was that if you had five grams of crack cocaine, which like isn't even a great afternoon, yeah. right? It's not a lot of crack. Um, that you would get a mandatory minimum sentence. The judge couldn't even deviate it, deviate from the sentence uh, based on external circumstances. You would get five years, hands down, every time. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, so can we talk about this? You growing up uh, a traditional, you know, household with your father and mother, but things, the, things change. Uh, you said you have the, the young, the record for the youngest incarceration <laughs> for no, selling drugs. The, the young, not incarceration, but the youngest arrest. Okay. I was 10 years. And, you know, I don't know that I would call my upbringing traditional. My, my parents liked to party. Um, they didn't get along too well. They got divorced when I was in fifth grade, which was, uh, you know, coincidentally the same time that I started selling drugs. So I was 10 years old and I was taking quarter pounds and then half pounds of weed 
uh, off of older kids in the neighborhood and selling them. And I got caught uh, by selling to other fifth, I was in fifth grade, 10 years old. And I was selling to other fifth graders and one of them got caught and he turned me in, set up a buy with the police. That's crazy. So you had, you had somebody inform on you that was also under like young. Yeah, well, I was like this badass little kid. And I yeah. was like, yo, man, you ever smoke weed? They're like, no. I'm like, you want to? <laughs> like, yeah. you know what I mean? And and so I was turning all these kids and in, in making noise in this yeah. small elementary school selling nicks and dimes. And, um, you know, he had never smoked weed before. I introduced it to him. I showed him how to do it. And then I was selling it to him. And then he got caught by his parents and, and he turned me in. Turned you in. Yeah. Uh, you, you mentioned the opioid crisis that happened during that period of time. What do you credit that to? I, I, I know we've recently had um, class action lawsuits against cert, certain pharmaceutical Pharma. companies. Yeah, yeah, certain pharmaceutical companies because they were over, doctors were over prescribing opioids. Well, they, they took Oxycontin, which a lot of people don't realize is pharmaceutical grade heroin. Yes. And they mismarketed it to doctors as a, a non-addictive painkiller. Yeah. So they essentially put heroin in a pill and then went to doctors and said, hey, this isn't addictive. Yeah. I mean, that was obviously a recipe for disaster. And, the, and that's what started the opioid epidemic. And that was in the mid and late 90s. And it exploded. The, the concept of crushing the pills and snorting them. This was something I wasn't even familiar with. Yeah, that's what happened to me. Yeah. 14 years old, one of my best friends growing up, you know, used to race motocross with them, shows up and crushes up a 40 milligram Oxycontin. I sniffed half of it, got high, loved it. Six months later, I was addicted to heroin, 15 years old. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So uh, and at, at this point, you also mentioned uh, a lot of violence. Yeah. In this time period. Right. When you think of like, again, I'm not from that part of the country, but like the, the rough guys that live in Southie and, yeah. you know, that just that those was the bar culture. fights. Yeah. Yeah. The culture back then is much different now that but like the coolest guys were the toughest guys. Yeah. You know, the toughest guy in the neighborhood was like the top dog, got the hottest chick and like was the, the top G of the neighborhood. And so everyone aspired to be like him. And so. If you want to be a tough guy, you got to be a tough guy. Was that something that uh, that caused you to go down this path? Also, you also mentioned uh, gangster rap, man. I remember that period of time <laughs> yeah. when I'm just like I'm learning how to speak English from Three Six Mafia and UGK and yeah. and uh, and NWA. Can you said that that had an influence on you also? Yeah, man. I mean, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade. You know, with the skip protection disc man and the headphones, riding my huffy yeah. bike around, listening to Biggie, Tupac, Mob Deep. You know. All, all the real hardcore shit that was out at the time. Yeah. And like, you know, you're nine, 10 years old, listening to violence and selling drugs and, and doing all this stuff. Of course it influences you. That's what you think is cool. Yeah. And then the other thing that I thought was interesting is you said there wasn't a real bag of heroin in the United States there after isn't. like 2012. Can you go into that? In 2012, it was a transitionary period that lasted a couple of years, but you know, Oxycontin hit the scene and then heroin flooded the streets because you know, the opioid epidemic of the, oxys got people addicted and heroin was cheaper and more readily available and then in 2012 2013 fentanyl showed up which is a synthetic uh opiate a synthetic drug that's 50 to 100 times more powerful than heroin itself people don't realize this because they forget the context of time prior to that you didn't really have overdose death like here and there but it wasn't like a prevalent problem in yeah. the country fentanyl shows up people start dropping like flies everyone i know is dying and um and in a short couple of years it went from heroin and fentanyl then it went from heroin mixed with fentanyl and then it went to fentanyl no heroin and now it's and now it's fentanyl in people are thinking they're doing coke or they're doing a xanax and it's in everything and uh and that's where overdoses just took off the supply for this fentanyl is the same issue where it's being over prescribed uh no no where, is, where's the supply come is, from this is being sold like similar to coke i mean it's being they, How does it get in the country is what I'm asking. They say it's the cartels. Okay. Right? They say it's manufactured in China and it's distributed and brought over the border by the, by the cartels south of the border. That's crazy. All right. Yeah. So um, now you also mentioned you had overdosed on this. If you can just talk about your upbringing from elementary school because you go from in, uh, elementary school getting arrested. You're addicted by yeah. uh, the time you're 15. But by the time you're 21, you're clean and you've started, uh, you go to rehab and then you end up, you know, starting opening your own sober house. What is the transition points in there? I, you know, I, 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 by the time I'm 10 years old, I'm smoking weed, I'm drinking, I'm selling weed and I want to be a tough guy. And I look up to gangsters and tough guys, 14 years old, I'm living that life, trying to be that guy. And, um, 
you know, would fight at the drop of a dime. Mm. Look at me, let's go. And that was the culture. By the way, I, 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 want, point, it, I want to point something out real quick yeah. before you go. Uh, we, the term toxic masculinity gets thrown out a lot, right? Yeah, yeah. The, the term came from in the 90s when you and I were growing up, prisoners, violent felons in prison, whenever they would go to escalate, you step, you stepped on my shoe, I'm going to stab you. Yeah. That was where the term toxic masculinity came yeah. from. Then what happened afterwards is psychiatrists got a, a hold of that word and they start using it for anything that is that they disagree with. So clo- yeah, that's a bunch of yeah, bullshit. like yeah. glo- glo- global warming, toxic masculinity, <laughs> higher taxes. It's because of toxic masculinity. Yeah. Men are not making in the working force. It's because of toxic masculinity. Men die from COVID more than women. It's because of toxic masculinity. And anyway, I just want to bring that up because when you said that you were down to fight all the time, that's actually where the term comes from. It doesn't come from just a man wanting to be a normal masculine human. Yeah, anyway. no doubt. And it makes sense because right. a lot of my world were people that were in and out of prison, yeah. you know, parolees hanging out with my dad and, you know, all that. And so. Yeah, very familiar, but, you know, Oxycontin turned to heroin, 15 years old. I drop out of high school from 15 till just about 22. Uh, I'm ripping and running, um, mm. selling drugs, doing drugs, robbing drug dealers, in and out of jail. Um, I OD five times. I end up on life support. I get stabbed a couple times. I get shot at. I get my head split open by a crowbar by the a gang in Massachusetts, a uh, Hispanic gang. I, You know, I'm going through it, dude. I'm, I'm crashing cars. I'm... And, uh, and I'm getting in all sorts of trouble all the time. So uh, you, you've talked about this on other podcasts. I'm, I'm curious about a couple of things. The one, no, one time you talk about robbing a drug dealer, you did it with a knife and you robbed a dude for $82. That was, the last, that was the last event, the last pivotal moment. My life changed the next day. Were there other times where you, did you ever rob anybody? Like you think of like Omar from uh, The Wire, right? The drug dealer who robs drug dealers. Yeah, 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 yeah. Was it ever like that? Were you it ever like- absolutely like You were hitting that. up, you knew where the stash was because you see where the kid Kicking comes the door out. in, coming in with a couple of my homies, yeah. tying people up and- taking the stash so that was a, a, a common thing for sure drug dealers robbing drug dealers i mean who are you gonna call afterwards right you can't call the cops so the funny thing is the kid that i robbed for 82 dollars did call the cops yeah he just didn't say <laughs> yeah, that he yeah. robbed you to he drug broke deal. the rules yeah. yeah 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 but no most of the time the the street handles the street stuff yeah and uh the cops are the least you worry so you yeah, just we were doing all that and and i remember like on the show like again you're you're watching these dudes on the you know on the corner Yep. And then you're just like, well, oh, I know when to set these guys up. I know when they do, you know, they do the re-up or whatever like that. And this is something that you were doing with your crew? That wasn't exactly, yeah, similar, yeah. similar, yeah. you know. Uh, the other you know thing, who's doing what on the street. You pay attention, you watch them. The, the thing where you get hit in the head by a crowbar, what, what goes on there? I had um, a leader of a Hispanic gang, gang in Massachusetts had a younger brother that was about my age, and I had a beef with him. And, uh, and I had the kids set up and then I found them and I fought them and I beat the piss out of them. Mm. And, uh, and a couple of days went by and I was at my house and I was laid out high as a kite, kind of nodding out in a recliner. And my front door came, front door came off the hinges. Mm. And 15 gang members roll in, beat the shit out of me, stomped me. And uh, right when I thought it was over, I kind of came up like, all right, guys, you got yeah. me. It's just in time for like a three foot crowbar thing. If you look behind my ear, my whole shit's fucked wow. up. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it put me off for like two days. That happened on a Monday night. I woke up on Wednesday. That's crazy, man. It was crazy. Yeah. That's great. Let me ask you, after that, are you guys still beefing? What happens out, uh, out, yeah. Yeah, from that point forward? You just want, like, because that is one of the issues, right, in these situations, because I grew up around drug dealers. Yeah. And, like, some of the times these beefs never end. It never ends. You it was, ma- the beef was part of daily life. Yes. Like, it was no start and stop to it. It was like, you're beefing with this one, you're beefing with that one. They get you, you get them. It was just that there's was no, part there's of, no signing a truce at the end. Yeah, I mean we're honestly going a little more in depth into the life that I normally did, and you, I'm impressed you did your homework. Yeah. Um, normally I talk about addiction, but the addiction is kind of the front. Like, yeah, I was addicted to drugs. Yeah. More than just the heroin was the life. Yeah, I mean I grew up with bangers, and that's the reason why. And yeah, East you Dallas, understand it. I yeah, get and, it. and it was such an epic. Like in Southwest Dallas, Oak Cliff was the murder capital of the I country. Know Oak Cliff. Yeah, yeah, back in, the, in like 1990. Yeah, it's bad out there. And and I would go play Madden at my homeboy's house, not realizing I'm sitting in a trap house. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like, why are somebody banging on the back door? Why do you have, <laughs> bro? You're 16 years old, and you got cameras out the back of your house. What are you doing? Yeah. Unscrewing the fucking potted plant, yeah, pulling the yeah. dope out, <laughs> screwing the bitch back on, and then going out, and then yeah. like, why are these people smoking in the back room? I didn't understand what was going on. I was fucking 14 years old. Playing. Yeah. I just want to play Madden. And, and it was just one of these things where I watched, and all of them are in prison, except for like two of them. All of them went to prison. 10 years, longer than that, for possession. Yeah. Um, and resisting arrest, like stuff like that. It was just crazy stuff that w- would go on. And so when I heard this part of it, it was just very interesting because that reality was different. I didn't know a single person who did heroin. It yeah. was crack. It was crack everywhere. And when I went to clubs with white people, it was powder. 
Yeah. That was powder and it was molly. That was all I saw. And then when I, when I hear about the stuff in the Northeast, I didn't know what fentanyl was. I didn't have any idea about that. So what, that's why that part is very interesting. I thank God that I got sober years before fentanyl right. came out. I would have died. Yeah. You know? The only reason I think I made it out is because I was out before that happened. Uh, you, you mentioned I thought this was an interesting idea because we were talking about listening to gangster music. You listen to gangster music, you have a BB gun. You roll, roll around on the streets with your uh, BB gun <laughs> on your bicycle. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I was a badass kid. Yeah. Man. Like, a lot of people tell their recovery story and they're like, you know, I had great morals and I was a functioning addict and, you know, I was just addicted to drugs. I, I was like obsessed with being like a terrible kid. Like, yeah. I just want, I watched gangster movies and rooted for the bad guy. You know, I had a CO2 pellet gun. I was 10 years old, rolling around on my bike, worried about getting robbed by older kids in my neighborhood. And so if they tried me, I'd shoot them with my PB gun. And uh, that's how it started out. It's a, I think it's a unique thing with American cinema where between The Godfather, American Gangster. Goodfellas. Goodfellas, where we, we it's really funny because when you go back and watch Casino, the attorney in, Great movie. in Casino is Oscar Goodman, who's the mayor of Las Vegas. Yep. Like that's where we put our gangsters in this country, like we see them as a higher, the most popular TV show of all time at the time was The Sopranos, yep. where we were actually able to look into the life of someone who would be the bad guy. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And it was interesting the way we uh, Breaking Bad, right? Yep. This is these are another other examples of this where we where we wanted to glorify this lifestyle. So it's it's inter it's interesting when you're a kid and you see that, and then you listen to NWA or you watch you know uh, Casino or Goodfellas, like how you get sucked into that, totally. right? And it and it's and it's helpful. And the girls liked it too. That was the other thing, you know. It made it kind of hard, is because the girls liked those dudes too, yeah. which made it which made it even harder those to. Those were the cool guys yes. that I knew. The coolest guys were like the baddest guys, and they were like the top guys. And so that's what I wanted to be. If I grew up in a neighborhood with CEOs and successful guys driving nice cars, and that's who all the girls wanted, then I would have wanted to be a CEO. But that's that wasn't where I came from. One of my favorite books is uh, Hustle Harder by Fifty Cent. Love and, that. And it's really funny because he goes back and forth to where like. At one point, he's working in A&R for a record company, and then he goes and flashes black to selling crack in Queens. And he's like, he's got lessons for entrepreneurs while he's a crack dealer in Queens. Yeah. And it's something that I think you were asking on another podcast where it's like, you see that a lot of these guys who are har hardcore entrepreneurs, Ryan Stuman is such a great example. Wes Watson is another great example. Yeah, friends they, of mine. They did wild shit, but like that fire was just, it was misplaced when they were younger. Yep. And now they become multi multi deca millionaires, hundred millionaires because they're using this fire in entrepreneurship. Does it teach you entrepreneurship? A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. I think I learned more from the street and selling drugs than most people learn in an MBA program. Yeah. I mean, I clearly I've done very well in business. I have a 15 year old dropout. I don't even have a GED. Yeah. I've never stepped on a college campus. Yeah. I mean, the story just seems so crazy. You're robbing drug dealers and you sold, you exit your business for a hundred million dollars. And it, it yeah. wasn't that long ago between the two things, right? Yeah, no, I got sober December 7th of 2006 and I sold my business, uh, December 21st of 2021. Yeah. Madness. 15 years, 15 years from the time you get sober to a $115 million. 15, 15 years on day one of 15 years. I'm on the run for armed robbery, 135 pounds, track marks up and down, two pairs of clothes in a trash bag, homeless, kicking a dope habit. And, uh, you know, 15 years later, just about selling the business for 115 million. Can you talk about now what happens uh, December 7, 2006, you come to this realization that this is your opportunity to change. And then when you do so, now you you get into what? What are you the, have the such a nice way of saying things? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I robbed a kid with a. It was a drug deal gone bad, and yeah. I, I robbed him with a butcher knife, a uh, kitchen knife, and uh, the night before. And they locked the neighborhood that I was in down, and were searching for me. And you're like, you had this epiphany. Like I just didn't want to die or go to prison. Yeah. Like I had no idea that I was changing my life forever. I was just like, I'm not going to prison, uh, and I gotta, you know, I gotta get clean. And that's, that's how it started. You went over the, uh, the origin of the 12 step program. Yeah. It was a six step program back in the 1930s. Can you go into that? So, so Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob are the co-founders of Alcoholics Anonymous and Bill Wilson was the first one. And Bill Wilson's a New York city stockbroker, um, struggling with alcoholism. He's in and out of a hospital called towns hospital under the care of a physician named Dr. Silkworth. And on his third time, essentially detoxing in this hospital, a member of this religious movement called the Oxford Group, which had broken off from the conventional church and created a six-step 
program of spiritual action to produce a conversional experience uh, came and saw him at his bedside. And they started doing this spiritual religious work with Bill. Uh, Bill has what he calls a white light spiritual experience, mm. which changes him from the inside out and removes his obsession to drink alcohol for the rest of his life. Um, I just opened a treatment center in Columbus, Ohio, a new one called White Light. White Light okay, Behavior yeah. Health. And you, you said you'd never met him personally. He died a year before you No, got that's sober. a different guy. Okay, it's, got it. You talk about a guy named Don Pritz here. Bill Wilson died in like the 60s or the 70s or something, mm -hmm. I forget. But um, yeah, and then, and then he takes that experience, works with 100 alcoholics, and uh, eventually the first one to get sober and stay sober is a, a proctologist, an ass doctor from Akron, Ohio. Yes. Uh, Dr. Bob, and that was the birth of AA, which was in June of 1935. It seems it seems interesting. I do know I, they were saying something. Dentists are like the highest likelihood of committing suicide, and a lot of it has to do with them pres prescribing themselves drugs. Yeah. Do you find a lot of doctors that that find their way into this, this doctors, whole problem? Doctors, nurses, dentists, um, licensed professionals like that. Yeah, we've treated thousands of them. And that's one thing you also mentioned is that it seems to be no socioeconomic group. Like it's across the board, the way addiction works. It's absolutely across the board. Yeah. Um, you, can you go into the 12 step program later on and what it, how it worked for you? I think a lot of people, you know, one of my best friends is an AA. She's been in it for uh, several years. Yeah. Well, I, I drunk CJ sparks. She, she talks about it all the time, the drunk CJ, she was wild. She was crazy. <laughs> I remember, but I didn't realize it was a problem because from my standpoint, we're just having fun. This is my friend who's a playmate. She's got a bunch of hot friends. They're all getting drunk. This is just fun. And then later on when she explains to me what was going on in her life, like I didn't understand. Yeah. And then she, AA, she does AA of the day and then she uses her platform to get more people into Alco Alcoholics Anonymous. That's great. You know, she's got millions of followers and a blue check mark and it's something that's worked out for her. Um, can you talk about what are the 12, like what are the things that work for you? Because obviously there were several attempts for you to get sober. And some of them didn't work. And then what eventually did work? Actually, let's go back. You're logging with your father. Yeah. And you're dope sick. Can you go from that point and then talk about what happens? I, you know, I, I get addicted to heroin at 15. Two years later, I'm 17 years old. I'm on a job site with my dad cutting down trees. It's the dead of the summer uh, up in New Hampshire. It's hot as hell out. And, and I'm dope sick. I'm in withdrawals uh, from the lack of having heroin. And... Um, and I just, I, I didn't know what to do. And it was my first real outreach for help. And yeah. So I was 17 and I walked up to my dad. He was operating a piece of an excavator. And uh, I got up in the track of the machine and said, dad, I need help. I'm addicted to heroin. And uh, he's a funny son of a bitch. You know, I, he said, well, I guess that's good news because I just thought you were fucking stupid. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I've never... like, I was like, all right, you know. Enough with the jokes, but um, and that was my first time uh, I detoxed under the care of, of medical people for the first time then, and so I guess it was about five years of this this repetitive cycle of I would I would get sober, not be able to stay sober, use again, and then go on a run, relapse, use drugs, and then want to be sober again. And it was five years of constant tries. I mean, I tried probably more than a hundred times. You said addiction is an internal condition. What is the thing that you figured out? Because uh, you have a, uh, yeah. the way you explain it, you, you figured out something that the traditional 12-step programs aren't doing that's causing these people to, to not go back in, in your system. No, it, it actually came from a deep intensive study of the origins of the 12-step program and mm. the origins of of that spiritual program of action. And, and the, probably the most powerful first thing that happened in my life when I got sober was I hooked up with a group of men that, that really educated on me on what addiction and alcoholism is and is not. Addiction and alcoholism was not my bad neighborhood. It was not my childhood trauma. It was not, you know, these bad influences. It's a three-part illness. It's one of what they call a phenomenon of craving, the physical aspect, and it's the one very thing that differentiates alcoholics and addicts from normal people, which is if I took, and people are like, why can't you, if you've been sober 16 years, why can't you just have a drink? If I have a drink, one thing that I know for certain is gonna happen is the next drink. Mm. And so when I start, I can't control a moderator. Yes. Like I, I just, I put myself into a place where I, I hand the keys over to someone else and someone else, my alcoholism is driving the car now, yeah. right? And, but that, that observation would be pointless if it was the only part of alcoholism or addiction. Like if it was, then people would go, well, okay, I understand the consequences. I'm never going to do that again. Like if, 
if having ketchup ruined your life, and once you started using ketchup, you couldn't stop using ketchup, you would just give it up and never think about it again. Yes. This is different. Where, where, this is where I was confused on what alcoholism and addiction was. It shows up more in sobriety than, than it does actually drinking and using drugs. And so when I would get sober, two things would happen. Internally, I would be filled with anxiety, depression. I'd be restless, mm. irritable, and discontented. My skin would be crawling. I couldn't sit still. I hated you. I hated myself. I just, I just couldn't stand life. I was just fucking uncomfortable. And then I would get this obsessive thought to get high. And that thought would be like this constant little chirping in the background. And eventually it would get louder and louder and louder to the point where I was so uncomfortable and so obsessed about using again that I would give into it. Mm. The spiritual program, like the, that's the internal condition. The internal answer was the 12 steps. Yeah. And in that, it's the, the design of the 12 steps is to produce transformational experience internally. And so if I can get right internally, I can get right spiritually, mentally, and emotionally, then I don't experience life like that anymore. And if I don't experience life like that anymore, I don't have any obsession to use drugs. You said when you were younger, the first time you went to a rehab clinic, it was outpatient, they gave you the drugs. That's right. And then you're supposed to just take the drugs and be better, and they didn't, that didn't address the, well. the, in, the internal <laughs> part of it. Yeah, that's right. Um, so from the outside, because I've never been drunk, dude. I've never tried drugs. Never no tried it. Yeah, I've never done anything. Never and been drunk. I've never been drunk, man. I know it's crazy. I had my, <laughs> first, yeah. drink, I had my first drink at 35. Uh, when, when I see my friends, because I'm always around it, yeah. And when I see my friends, I see the ones who are, have it under control, it goes one, two, three, four, five. And the ones who don't have it under control, it goes one, two, and then 10. One, That's two, right. and then I'm naked on top of the bar. Yeah, one, yeah. two, and then I'm, t I'm taking a piss out on the street, and I'm, uh, or it's a female friend, I'm going home with a stranger. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. one, two. When I talk For to- For me, it was one, two, I'm in the projects looking for coke and heroin. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and yeah. then it goes, it's been three months. What happened? Yeah, three months and then on a bender, and you That's just right. don't even remember. Uh, yeah. I had one one of my friends. She's uh, one of CJ's friends, and she was talking to me about this, and she was like, she was like explaining that she didn't have sex other than on these benders. Like she when she quit AA, she like hadn't been Sober with a dude. Sex. Yeah, she hadn't been with a dude in years because like she didn't know how to formulate that. At Vegas, Dave, he was yeah. on here one time. And he said the same thing. He's like, he hadn't had sober sex in like so long. And it's one of these crazy things where like these girls had been with a bunch of dudes, don't even know who they've been with. And then they get off of it and they don't know how to like, you said before about the anxiety and like seeing yourself. Mm -hmm. And then you, it, it was funny because you think of the alcohol making you lose control. And you mentioned, you made such a great point. The alcohol, when you're a, a sober, control. when you're sober addict, the alcohol helps you gain control. That's right. Yes. And that's actually a really astute observation on your part because I actually say that all the time where most people, most normal people would use drugs and alcohol and feel like they were losing control. I would get high and get drunk and feel like, oh yeah, yeah. now I'm in control. Yeah. Affect regulation. I'm regulating my emotions mm. and regulating my affect through the use of substances. And so I have essentially medication that I constantly use and I know how to balance and I know how to control how I feel and how I experience this world. And then you rip that away from me and I have nothing. Mm. And my emotions are like a roller coaster. I'm all over the place. I mean, and so to have like a normal functioning relationship, let alone like a healthy, intimate sexual relationship, like these things are all things most of us have to learn for the first time or yeah. learn again or, you know, repair. Yeah. Some of my favorite people ever, and some of them, like, they're super charismatic and I like really care about them a lot. The tough part of them, the, I'm talking about a lot of them, female, uh, they, they are incapable of having any kind of connection with somebody they're not doing drugs with yeah. or they're not drinking with. And then when they get sober, it's just like, oh, just let's just go have fun like we were doing before. And they can't. can't. And it yeah. really, it really is kind of like sad to watch the whole thing happen. Uh, one of the things I, I the, one of the things that, it pisses me off when I hear this all the time, and I'm sure you've heard this before. It's this one where I'm drunk, so let me do blow so that I can drive home sober. And I'm like, <laughs> hey, I'm just trying to explain to you, you're not more sober when you do co This is, so many people are gonna scream at the screen right now when I say this. Cocaine doesn't make you sober from being drunk. It raises your heart, now you're an alert drunk. 
They legitimately think that cocaine makes them smarter. I had one dude, uh, he was a CEO of a company telling me cocaine is a nootropic that helps him. And I'm like, I'll bet you there's probably some study that shows in the first 3% of the use that maybe that's true, but then it just de degenerates after that. You talk about some of the excuses that people make in order to keep doing this. I mean, every excuse, I've yeah. heard them all. Yeah. I mean, you know, in my career at the business that I sold, it was an addiction treatment business. I mean, we treated, I don't know, 50,000 clients, yeah. patients, rather. And so, I mean, addiction is so crazy. It starts off with that, and it ends with, you know, a, a pregnant woman still going to shoot dope with a good excuse of why she has to do it. Mm. It's like, it's just completely insane. Yeah. There's just so much insanity wrapped up in addiction. Uh, you know, you had to drink, you had to get high in order to have sex. Like you, yeah. like you need it. And it's, it's crazy. The other one was, uh, I need to get back to my kids. They're, so they're in a program and they're away from their kids. So they need to go get back to their kids. And they oh, the using. excuses that people have to leave treatment or disengage from a recovery process, you know, uh, uh, it, it is insane. You know, I have to get back to my kids. I have to get back to my job. You know what? It, and it's expected from them. The crazier part is when we get it from their family. Mm. And it's like, mom, this kid's been shooting dope in your basement and robbing your ATM card, and he's been away for three weeks, and you're begging for him to come back. Yeah. This is crazy. And I always try to explain to him like this. Say, hey, listen, if your loved one had cancer and there was like uh, an inpatient treatment that was known that if you do everything we tell you to do, it will put your cancer into remission. Like you're going to live a normal life. You're always going to have it but it's gonna be in a state of remission as long as you continue to do this stuff. But you gotta be here for like 90 days. Would you be arguing to get your loved one, uh, or would you even contemplate when they called you at week three or two or one and said, hey, I'm good, I, I, like I've done enough cancer treatment, I gotta come home. You know, it's craziness. And they're like, you know, yeah, you kind of have a good point there, Eric. I'm like, no shit. I, I think one of the things, because that's such a great analogy, is that the cancer, doesn't make you more charismatic. I think what happens, <laughs> you, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you heard Lil Boosie talking about, uh, I, I showed him a clip the other day, Lil Boosie talking about, I prefer crack over fentanyl because yeah, yeah, yeah. fentanyl is killing people. It's like every crackhead is a comedian. The most charismatic, fun people I've ever met when I go to EDC or if I go to a bar, they've been drinking, they've been doing some drugs yeah. and they're fun and they're wild. And the other thing is, I don't, you know, it's a myth or it's the truth, but it's the weekend when he talks about when I'm fucked up, that's the real me. And a lot of people feel that way. When they're fucked up, that's the real them. And then the sober them is not the real them. And there's just, there starts to be this mix. And being a completely sober person around these drunk people, I see them for these small glimpses. They're genuinely fucking happy. And then they have to come out well, of it and deal with real life. It, because they're a slave and a prisoner to, to their own anxiety, depression. Yes. And so when they drink, it removes that for them. They, you know, they're looking at those girls, those hot chicks, and they want to talk to them, but sober. They're like, oh, my. They could never. They could never even stand up and walk across the room. Give them three, four, six drinks, and bing, they're on it because yeah. it's removed all of that stuff for them. But it doesn't mean it's the real them. them. Yeah. That's not your, like, true essence and your true self. Like, yeah. You can, you know, do personal development work, spiritual, emotional, whatever, and, uh, and remove that stuff in sobriety it's just hard work and takes time the difference between they actually recovery and personal development and all of that and heroin and alcohol have have the same effect heroin and alcohol will remove the fear the depression and the anxiety immediately yes recovery and and personal development will it just takes a long time and it's yeah. a lot of work you also talked about doing the corny shit right the you getting made fun of by guys when you start because when you get into the 12-step programs you're saying a lot of things that a lot of people who are still using think sound I used to trite. get made fun of yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I, I mean I was 22 almost 22 years old you know in my prime talking about sobriety yeah and like no one thought that was cool yeah and recovery is a lot more socially accepted today than it was back in 2006 7 8 right yeah at the time like there weren't even young people that were sober it wasn't there were no celebrities that were in recovery Eminem was still getting high. You know, he wasn't putting out sober tracks yet. Like, it's just the whole world is pivoted. But at the time, for me, they used to just straight up shit on me all the time. Yeah. It is one of the good things about social media is a lot of people going through recovery and sharing their story. It's and, visible. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I got sober before MySpace. Yeah. You know? Yeah.
Yeah, definitely. The other thing I really uh, appreciated was because I have to deal with this with my performance coaching and I had to deal with this with when I was in the US military was mom being afraid, like you can't say things to offend certain people and mom being afraid to say no to the, like you said before, uh, wants to get the child out of, um, out of treatment. Uh, and there, there's these certain truths. You said there was a group of men who gave you honest truths about yourself, even when it they offended loved, you. They loved me enough uh, to tell me the truth, no matter how I felt about it. Yeah. Yeah. I love the saying that, like, they won't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Yeah. And so, you know, establishing rapport and establishing, that's what they did with me. Very quickly, I was like, these guys care about me mm. for, like, real reasons, which was really weird coming from the street where nobody really cares about anybody. Yeah. And, um, and they established that. And so because they had established this baseline, they were able to tell me things that I probably would have lost my shit on somebody for yeah. if I didn't have that relationship with them. Do you remember what some of these things were? Sit down and shut the fuck up. Yeah. You don't have anything good to say. Nobody cares what you think. <laughs> like, I mean, yeah. they were brutal on me. Yeah. They were like, no, don't. I was like, well, what I think is put your hand down. We don't want your, you were just so sick that if you say anything, the only thing you're going to do right now is spread your sickness on us, and we don't want it. So yeah. you just listen. You don't have anything to contribute yet. You know, I mean, they're hard on me, bro. Like they, they did not make it easy. That's incredible. Do you? It was great. Do this you exactly what I needed? Do you now, like again, hundred million, hundred million dollar exit, and before that, you and we'll get into like how you just how you scaled up your company. Yeah. Do you choose to have? Because I do. Choose to have people around you, even now, who Absolutely. tell you when you fuck up. Can you talk about have that? To. Yeah. Um, I mean, show me your friends. Show me your, you'll show me your future. Like the people around you. I think one of the most practical things that you can do to change your life is to change the people around you and audit your circle. And so, you know, I don't keep a bunch of yes men or yes women around me. I mean, the closest person to me in the business is my chief of staff. She's in my Instagram stories all the time. Her name's Lori. She's like my biggest fan and my harshest critic. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I'll come off of something and she'll be like, yeah, you really fucked that up. I'm yeah. Like, oh, thanks. <laughs> like, good. And so, yeah, you need that. And because at a, I don't know, um, you see a lot of people that surround themselves that, with people that tell them what they want to hear and, yeah. and keep them comfortable like a pacifier. And that's not where success happens. It's not where growth happens. It's not, you know, happens in, you know, outside of your comfort zone. I have a, a few friends who are exceptionally wealthy live here they go party all the time and I hang out with them and I see the people that are around them yeah and two things I notice is one they're always saying yes like you said the yes man always trying to please and number two when they see me around and I'm not willing to do that I'm a threat and then they want me out of the yep. group okay this is something I've noticed as one of one of my buddies that I'm friends with now I wasn't friends with a couple years ago because this this pit of vipers that was always around him all they would do is shit on me because I'm just like I don't need your money bro I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm doing good and so what I noticed for me personally was I tell the other execs in my company that, that work for me, I'm like, you guys can always outvote me, okay? Unless it's something extreme, right? You want me to post crazy shit on my social media. Other than that, if you guys want to outvote me, you always have the right to do this. Other the other employees, if I fuck up, you tell me that I fuck up. You can call me anytime you want. And I do this whole thing because I want to promote something that I learned from being in the, the air crew and the aircraft. Just because a lieutenant colonel flying the plane and I'm, a, and I'm just a lieutenant, doesn't mean I can't tell him, you know, sir, let's put the gear down. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, flaps yeah, are not, yeah. flaps are, flaps should be at 30. I've had this situation before where I've had to tell somebody who outranked me, hey, bro, we got to put the gear down. We're going to fucking die. Yeah, you know yeah. what I'm saying? <laughs> one time they, one time the fucking cockpit was on fire and I'm like, I'm yelling at Major, the Major, like, yo, we're on fucking fire right now. And you're not supposed to do that, you know, when you're a lieutenant. And so it was, it was one of those situations. So like, I really appreciated that about you having guys willing to tell you the truth no matter what. Um, and at the time you're a new junkie coming into their system, but like, even when you're the boss, you know yeah, what I'm saying? Absolutely. You still, you still have those people around you. hundred percent. Yeah. And so another thing I appreciate about having Dan Fleischman and then being friends with Brad Lee and being friends with, you know, even, uh, Wes Watson or being friends with Ryan Stuman, they'll tell me if I fuck up a hundred percent, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I had, I had a really big conundrum when Andrew Tate's like the most hated dude in the world. And he and I are messaging each other back and forth and I want to have him on my podcast but I'm friends with these female influencers who are going to fucking hate me when I have them on. And yeah. so I'm asking Dan Fleischman, I'm like, should I do this? It's like, you have to do this. Like, it's not your, it's not your business. They're going to understand this is going to how, how you grow. And I just needed somebody to tell me this who's more experienced and more successful than me so yeah. that I knew exactly what to do. 100%. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, so uh, they got you involved in service work. This is another thing that I see is really great. I work at a, um, uh, uh, what's it called? a food pantry up in North yeah. Vegas. And 
and seeing how that can change a lot of people to bring them into the present moment so they get over their bullshit. Can you talk about how service work has helped? Service work was then and still is now one of the most pivotal things in my life, right? Like, here's what's funny is I, I was newly sober. My first apartment was $550. I didn't have furniture and couldn't afford heat. I slept on a pile of blankets, but I was being of service. Every day I went, I made a little bit of money working construction, and then I would go help uh, drug addicts and alcoholics find recovery themselves. And, and I just exhausted myself doing this. Sleeping on a pile of blankets in the winter with no heat, mm. happy as shit. Yeah. And I've had times where I'm sitting on stacks of cash in my big old house with my nice cars and my boat and all my shit. And like, you know, the human experience, you, you constantly, you deviate from your diet, you deviate from this, you de and, and looking and, and had that missing piece of my life. And I'm like, why am I so angry right now? Why yeah. do I have to have anxiety? Like it's, it just, it feeds your soul. Like if it's not about other people, it just tends to be shallow and meaningless, right? So there were points where you were get, going through recovery, walking to work. You said you would walk to other uh, treatment facilities to yeah. work. And those points, sometimes you were happier than when you were wealthy and successful. I can tell you definitively, there have been times where I've had absolutely nothing, but I was sober and being of service and doing the stuff that I do to take care of me that I've been happier at times that I've been sitting on millions yeah. of dollars and uh, lots of success and everything else. That's what I tell people when they start my program. It's like, there's a part of me that's jealous because you're gonna have some nights where you come to realizations and you can only do that once. Yeah, 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 like, yeah, real, yeah. like you can only, the first time you read Moby Dick or the first time you read Catch-22 or the first time you read uh, All Quiet on the Western Front, you can't go back and ever read it again. And it's beautiful the first time you do it. Yeah. And it's, but it's beautiful in a way that's like purely beautiful and there's no, you don't need extra things involved. And then later you build parts of your life because you have money and this really hot girlfriend and you're living like the life that you dreamed, but there's an authenticity, like you manufactured that, whether there was an authenticity of you just having that moment yep. organically when it happened, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, the, the sober house. Now, uh, you, this is something, were you the first person to come up with this concept of, of sober house in 06? I, I was the first person to do it in the state of New Hampshire. Okay. Can you, talk, can you explain what a sober house is? It's a, it's a home. It's a, it, mine was a three-family home, three apartments. Excuse me. And, um, and we had guys in beds that stayed there. And I lived with them for two years, from 2008 to 2000. I started in 2008, and I lived with 11 men until 2010. And then I eventually moved out and replaced myself as the house manager of the house. Uh, but these guys would come to me fresh out of rehab, fresh out of prison, um, you know, with the history of addiction, history of alcoholism, really not having much life skills, not knowing what to do, not knowing how to live. And I, I would teach them how to stay sober. I would teach them recovery. I would teach them life skills. I would be that man in their life that loved them so much that I didn't care how they felt. And so I would feed them hard truths, um, you know, and, and help them transform their lives. And that's how the business started. So can you explain the economics of this? So like in 08, uh, President Obama gets elected and there's yeah. there's now all of a sudden there is mandated treatment for, for money. In 2012. 2012. Passes, so the Affordable can, Care Act. How, how does, care. can you go over that? So how are these guys affording the sober house these in the guys beginning? Are, these guys, some of them uh, came in, the, I mean, it was 150 bucks a week. Got it. So it was very like in the beginning, I didn't make any money for the first few years. I mm. did it because I was still going and cutting trees down every day and doing this. Yes. It's not like I was like balling out of control. I was sleeping in a bedroom with 11 other newly sober dudes driving me crazy every day. Mm. Um, but Obama, Obama uh, passed Affordable Care Act. Prior to the Affordable Care Act, which came out in 2012, addiction on health insurance was optional and as a covered benefit. It was a rider similar to like, you could opt into dental, opt into vision, or you could opt into behavioral health care, which covered both addiction and mental health. So a lot of people had health insurance, but didn't have access to healthcare services mm. for addiction and alcoholism prior to the Affordable Care Act. And so when that came out, it, it, they had a, a piece of that, that plan called Parity, which essentially said that it mandated insurance companies provide a benefit for addiction and mental health treatment on all insurance plans, and that it stopped being treated like the little annoying cousin of healthcare. You know, healthcare providers didn't really treat addiction very seriously prior to that. And so, like, it was not, it didn't hold water next to diabetes and heart disease. Sure. And this basically said that you have to treat addiction with the same seriousness that you treat 
diabetes and heart disease. So one of the, the things I talk about in my program is becoming a subject matter expertise. You, having been a former addict, made you uniquely qualified yes. in order to be able, because you knew the excuses. You knew what, what you knew where all the blitzes were coming from. You had seen all the coverages. Knew the game. You knew the game per perfectly. Yep. And then this happens when the Affordable Care Act comes out. Do you see this now as a viable business model, or is it something you just sort of stumble into having the I sober houses? I just stumble into it. Yeah, yeah. Like I didn't even even when it happened, I didn't even really understand it. I didn't yeah. know. I didn't understand health insurance. I didn't understand much of it at all. But then I was watching what was happening, what other people were doing, and that was my first like, oh, something something's up here yeah other people were making these treatment facilities and make a lot of money it, it, there were treatment facilities prior to that when that happened the industry started explosive growth right um and then uh the other thing that i thought was interesting is that you never had to take any investors money you bootstrapped your way all the way up to yeah. 100 million how, how does that work out because i see a lot of that where people i'm constantly being hit up by people asking me to invest in their business and i've never felt the need to invest have investors come in how are you able to do that was there ever a time when you had people try to come in and, and uh buy into your business initially a lot of my a lot of this path is like ignorance is bliss like mm. i didn't even know to look for an investor i was just like well i need more money i better yeah. spend less and save it you know what yeah. i mean like again i didn't come out with an mba i learned this i learned how to fly the plane midair yeah and so you know i've i've always been in real estate as well and so i was flipping houses i was building real estate selling real estate building condo developments and i did that to fund my personal lifestyle and I ran the business as shrewdly as I could, and all of the money that it made, I put right back into the business, yeah. right back in, right back in, right back in. And so I never, for probably more than 10 years, never took any money out of the company. Yeah. And so, you know, I would hustle outside of the business to... So real estate paid for your lifestyle, yeah. and then you kept putting money back into this. One of the things I, I really uh, appreciated was, I can't remember if it was you or was the guy interviewing you, who said something to the effect of, you get all this capital and you have all this money and but you're you still need to live poor for a while while you're building the business and it's really hard for these people to keep living poor eating poor while they they're sitting on millions of dollars because that money is supposed to go back to yeah. the business but like because you think you're rich when you get all the seed capital but you're not actually rich this is supposed to go back this is a huge honestly that's as big of an epidemic with entrepreneurs as i see is like especially with my company, I, I don't want to run up these extra expenses. I watch other companies do this. And as soon as they have a down month, this bloat then takes over the rest of the company. Yep. And that's an issue. You never had that issue. You would, you keep running this thing as inexpensively as possible on the way up. As lean as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Ran it very lean, watched every dollar. It was all my money. Yeah. And so it meant more, right? Like when you have a, a, a angel investor or a seed money or, you know, a series a, um, I think that people can lose track around like this is real money. Yeah. You know? And so I Well I think I, I think the problem is they think I it's their money. Dollar, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But yeah. if I spent a dollar, I already had to earn it. Yeah. And I knew what it take to earn already took to earn it. And so it meant that much more on how I deployed it. Yeah. I've seen especially in the self help space, a lot of people make this mistake. They're spending money that they haven't gotten yet. They're spending money on programs they haven't even sold yet. I've seen yeah. this kind of thing happen before where, and they need additional funding from people outside. And, I, and it's just very confusing to me. Cause like you said, you had a business that would pay for itself. I've always, I had a guy come to me and like offered me 50% of his business for some amount of money. And my, my first thought was, why would you need this money from me if this business is functioning properly? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I would, for half my business, I'm not, I'm not even blinking anything below $15 million, $20 million. I wouldn't need, because we make money. Like why would I need yeah. this outside investment? That's always the way I think about it. And it, it just, yeah. I never think about it as like, if I just get some more money, then we can start making money. I'm like, that doesn't sound like a business to me, yep. you know? And that Absolutely. sounds like what you had, because here's the other thing, which I thought was super impressive. And these are, I want to transition over into the real estate stuff. You buy that first treatment facility for a hundred grand. 150, you know, yeah. One of the things I, I, I think is, is interesting from both sides of the perspective was one, the people who are dealing with delusions that are addicted. And number two, people who aren't addicted, who are also dealing with delusions at the beginning of the 2008 financial crisis, you said there you apparently you go talk to this dude you say he wants 1.2 million for the place that was that was later on in 2000 the first building i bought was the multifamily for 150,000 on the bank foreclosure yeah that was fast forward 2012 okay uh that i went and bought my actual first licensed healthcare treatment facility 
And you yeah. and you, the guy wanted one point two million. And can you tell tell the story? Like he told you to fuck off. And yeah, what, yeah, yeah. I'm happened? standing on the driveway. He wanted, and this is how like much I, I mind you. I started my business in two thousand and eight. Yeah. So for anyone old enough, you couldn't get a mortgage. You couldn't get a yeah. loan. You couldn't get anything. And so when I, again, timing is it means a lot. So when you say I bootstrapped the whole way, like, well, in 2008, 9, 10, and 11, you didn't have a choice. Yeah. You walk into the bank and ask them to borrow money to, for anything, and they'd be like, get out. Yeah. And, um, and so I didn't even think about getting a mortgage for that property. That's what's funny. I was like, I got 300 grand I can spend. Yeah. And so I offered them 300 grand, I think it was, standing in the driveway. I was like, but I know you want 1.2. I got 300 right now if you want it. And he was like, fuck you, you thief. Get off my property and all this shit. And, uh, and that was in the summer. And then that December, the real estate agent called me and said, Eric, the bank foreclosed on the property. And he needed the 1.2 because that's what the mortgage was. He was just trying to pay off the debt. Yeah. And, um, and so do, it's going to auction next month. Do you want to go? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. I went and checked it out. And I ended up winning the real estate auction for the property for 100 grand. 100 grand. So 100 they do, grand. I just, but what's I, crazy yeah. is fast forward. I put a little money, not much, into the place. I renovated. I opened a treatment center there. And still, like, these, this is how I learned just by doing it and kind of dumb luck. My friend, who now I have a relationship with a bank and I'm buying real estate and I'm getting mortgages and all these other buildings, and I'm looking at purchasing this big property for $10 million. And he tells me, he's like, we need $2.5 million in order to do this. I'm like, his name's John. I'm like, John, I don't have $2.5 million just sitting around to, to buy this piece of property. He's like, well, let me look at your assets. He's like, what's this? address right here i'm like oh i bought that thing i fit it up blah, blah blah we went out sent an appraiser out there he went looked at it. he goes eric this is probably worth five and a half million it appraised for yeah and so i i ended up putting up the equity based on that appraisal in purchasing the 10 million dollar deal and it just all worked out beautifully and then so, i ended up selling all of that property last august for 26 million bucks so that's that's the part i wanted people to hear is that you buy this property after a foreclosure for 100 grand yeah. after the dude told you to go fuck yourself yeah, yeah, yeah. when he wanted 1.2 million then later on the you, the the property gets appraised you know this is the the other question i had was what what is causing the appraisal to go up? Obviously, we're sub, subprime mortgage crisis had something to do with it. But what causes the? Oh, well, actually, no. This is 2012, so this isn't even. This isn't, just, a, this yeah, isn't this the is time. coming out of the recession. So he just happened to foreclose. This has nothing to do with subprime mortgage crisis. He just happened the, to get foreclosed on. The tenant defunct. Okay. And for you know, he had whatever problems that he had and couldn't afford to carry the property, and so yeah. he gave it back to the bank. What makes it now worth four million dollars? Is it the number? Is it the number of acres? Is it the facility? Is it the business you've built on it? What causes that it's, high of a valuation? The neighborhood? The rent. The rent. The rent. Yeah. I mean, you think about value in commercial property; it's based off a cap rate of the rent roll. Yeah. And so I just started paying myself rent, and when I say I made money on real estate, I did a lot that had nothing to do with the business. But I also would buy the real estate and then lease it to the business and make money off the rents that I would pay myself from the operating And company. you get to write that off? Depreciate the real estate. Yeah. Know. Okay. Wow. Yeah. All right. That's incredible. All right. But no, what I'm saying is you're, when you're paying rent, even though you're paying it to yourself, do you not get to write that off as part on your taxes? It, it goes from one hand to the other. Yeah. You know okay. I mean? Got like it. I write it off here, but I have to claim it as income. Got here. it. Okay. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because I was I remember listening to that and I was like the idea of What's buying the, a building and then renting, you become the chief tenant of the building that you're But that you if own. you're an active real estate professional uh, as a task, tax designation, um, you're depreciating the buildings, taking the bonus depreciation and mm. writing that off on all of your active income on the operating company as well as the rent roll. The the one, the other property that you buy that you end up selling for 15 million, is that correct? It was the second property? I sold that one for 15, yeah. What did you buy it for? 10. So what, what again, the appreciation comes from rent? Like yeah, just the rent's the going part, up? Wow, yeah. that's pretty amazing. Yeah. So this is a secondary thing that's going on while you're also building these treatment There's a facilities. lot of power, yeah. And that's one thing that I learned along the way was the power of real estate through sale leaseback strategies, right? Like you could develop the real estate. If you have an operating company, say you have a coffee shop, okay, you're gonna grow the business. You want liquidity. You don't wanna sell any of the equity of the operating company because you, wanna, you don't want partners and you don't wanna deal with that and you don't wanna sit on your board and, and whatever, but you want liquidity. You go and buy a piece of real estate and develop it to be another coffee shop, and then you you start the move the business in as the tenant, and then you can control the value what you could sell the real estate for. 
Okay, well, the rent's $10,000. Well, if I want to sell the real estate for more, okay, I'll lease it back to myself for $15,000. Mm. It's all based off of a cap rate, based on the credit rating of the company and the market. And so it's, 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 it's an unbelievable strategy to create liquidity along the way of growing the business where I'm growing the company, I'm keeping the operating company, I'm buying the real estate asset, I'm securing a lease and guaranteeing the lease by my operating company. And then I'm selling the asset once it's established and, and have proven, uh, proven the model successful. It's open, it's cash flowing, I can show the financials, and yeah. then I can go sell that on the open real Some REIT will pick it up. Um, do you have mentors who are teaching you these techniques at the time, or are you just learn it all on your own? Both. Both? Both. Yeah, I'm learning it by watching other people. I'm learning it by getting advisors, um, you know, getting the best tax guy, the best lawyer, the best real estate guys. My real estate agent started some some guy in New Hampshire, and now my real estate agent's office is on Wall Street in New York City. Mm. Big difference, you know, and you can learn a lot from these people. Separately from that, I started going out well before mentorship and coaching and, you know, all this stuff on Instagram was even a thing. This is, you know, years and years ago. I started going out and finding people and having the humility to ask. Yeah. Be like, hey, man, like, I respect your hustle. I respect the journey. Can I buy you a cup of coffee yeah. just to have a conversation? You, you took a program with Gary Vaynerchuk also? I did. I went yeah. and did a day uh, with Gary and, and my buddy Nick Dio. Uh, that was back in 2018. Mm. And uh, yeah, that was, you know, as I started to look at the power of social media and start to consider building a personal brand myself, uh, that was kind of my first introduction to it was through Gary and, and that's meeting at his office. It's really interesting for people that are older. I, I heard, and he's not that much older, but like Alex Ramosi even talked about this. He was like, I didn't want to get involved with social media, but I just saw the power that it had yep. whenever something I did went viral. And it's the same thing for me. I, li I like to raise money for charity. It's one of my hobbies. And having a really stunning uh, social media influencer show up, regardless of what you think about the situation, the money just shows up. We yep. get the money for the animal rescue or whatever. And the power of social media, while some people may find it vapid and shallow, it's just so useful for being able to scale and grow your business. And so much of it is free. Totally agree. Yeah. Uh, this, the other thing that I thought was great was, uh, and some, this is a place where I'm getting to, is creating systems. So you were getting, you were getting reports quarterly from all of your different businesses at the same time, and you had your hands in all of it until you started creating uh, te leadership teams and systems. The, the business just had explosive growth, right? Yeah. I, I took a lot of risk. I bought a lot of properties to create facilities. I hired a lot of staff. I created a lot of beds, you know, the amount of people that we could treat. And started building a business and you know by the time like 2016 17 at one point i had i think 17 direct reports mm. and like i didn't understand an organizational chart i didn't understand chain of command these are all things that i had to learn which i've since learned and mastered and gotten very good at and it burnt me out i was like bro i'm up at i'm up at five o'clock in the morning and most nights i'm not going to bed to 12 and all i'm doing is working and I'm putting out fires and, I'm, and I'm, I'm like, this is not sustainable. And so I started to study, I'm like, what do companies do? And that's when you know, I, I really got an in-depth education on creating systems, processes, developing leadership teams, developing an org chart, developing chain of command, um, KPIs, uh, measuring the business, yeah. and being able to have insight on performance there, and teaching kind of uh, learning rather uh, all the different ways to structure this and build it, and uh, and so from two, I probably started that in 2017, and then you know was implementing all along the way. For that specifically, were there any mentors like the E Myth Revisited is the first thing that comes to mind when we talk about building systems? Was there a a, a mentor or a book had, that helped you with that? Uh, I've read a lot of books, but I would say the the main attribution to who helped me was I have a handful of guys that are older. They don't have it. They don't even have a Facebook. Mm. Like you're not going to find them on yeah. social media. Uh, they're guys I know. They're from my home area that are in the mid to high nine figure club and several in the billionaire club um, that have been gracious enough to be my mentors for years. And so I learned a ton from them, a ton, 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 and eternally, you know, grateful for the education from them. The training of a guy to be your CEO. Yeah. Remember you talked about that. How, how do you find that person? There's a lot of things for me personally, like I'm still editing YouTube videos and I and like my, my, the other execs are like, you have to stop doing this. 
we are, we'll find a guy in Nepal to do this. This yeah, is ridiculous. But I can do it better than the I guy can do in better. Nepal. <laughs> yeah, walk, walk, me personally, walk me through this, man. Finding a guy to replace some of the things you do. Yeah. How do you turn? How do you first of all? How do you find the trust in order to do that? And second of all, how do you find the right guy who's going to do that? And third of all, how do you train that guy? You know what's funny is everyone uh, wants to talk about that they're a good judge of character, right? Mm -hmm. talk, I'm a good judge of character. Well, if we looked at all the people you hired, yeah. Would you still be? Some you know, of them, yeah. Some, some of them, them not exactly. so much. Yeah. Some of them not so much. And so, you know, for that position, we used an external recruiter. Yeah. Um, you know, this isn't a guy that's going to reply to your ad on Indeed. Yeah. Um, you have to, you know, really use your network. We had a large sweeping process of candidates. I, I don't even, I probably interviewed more than 20 people mm. uh, and touched a lot of things and learned a lot through that process on the right skill sets, the right personality traits and the wrong ones. And I originally hired him for be my chief operating officer. The guy I en ended up hiring, and this is interesting, you're talking about systems, processes, organizational chart. I went from, in 2017, having 17 direct reports. In 2020, I quit the business myself. I moved to executive chairman. I don't talk to anybody for a year before I sell it. I go to a board meeting once a month. I'm down in Florida, out on my boat doing other business, doing real estate, hanging out. And uh, it's just like this wild index of like, I don't have five minutes to myself to like, God, I wish they needed me more. I'm yeah, board, exactly. You know? and, um, and so I hired this guy and, and the guy that I hired and one of the advice advices that I would give to people is, that I, my business was doing about 55 million of top line revenue. His biggest job on his on his resume was he was the CEO of a two billion dollar annual revenue publicly traded kidney dialysis business. This guy was incredibly smart. He was smarter than me. Like he ran circles around me, and so I brought him into my company as my number two. And so here I am, you know, 35 years old, managing a 52 year old man who had jobs that you know, would eat my lunch all day long. Yes. He was very patient with me and I'm kind for that. I'm, I'm grateful for that. He was very patient and kind. And, uh, and, but I taught him the nuances of this business and of this vertical and of addiction treatment and all of that. And the trust was built over time. I didn't just bring him in and hand him the keys. I guess in some situations you might have to, uh, but in this, we worked together for, I think about a year. He's the CEO and you don't think he's going to be the CEO initially, but out over he's, time you come to that realization. C he's the COO yes. that I hired and it was part of a succession plan. Okay. So it was part of a succession. Yeah. Okay. I was like, this guy eventually is going to take my spot. Yes. And, um, but I brought him in as number two. We spent almost a year together every day and then sat down and I was like, man, you know, it's time. And so. So one of the things I think is interesting is that one of the things that made you great at this job was that you were a former addict. Yeah. And I'm guessing this guy wasn't. He was not. He, very traditional, came from a traditional background. So there's certain street smart things that you understood building this business that yeah. you probably had to impart on him, but yet his level of efficiency and productivity was probably much higher. That's exactly true. And again, you know, having the humility and the ability to learn is incredibly important. Yes. And so, you know, if you can't hire someone smarter than you mm. and have the humility to learn from them, you're going to be bottlenecked in business. Yeah. Like you're going to, you're going to plateau yourself because you, if you're the smartest guy on your leadership team, you fucked up for sure. Yeah. I'm you having know? these, I'm having these exact thoughts. I'm like, nah, I'm really good at getting a bunch of girls to show up to a party. Maybe I shouldn't be CEO <laughs> of this company. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. I should have somebody taking that part. Yeah. Of yeah. Yeah. Me. Like, yeah. I, you know, I talk to the patients better than you do. Yeah. He's like, okay. <laughs> awesome, bro. Good, bro. Let's, yeah. let's go buy some real estate. So yeah. here's the other thing. Um, there's two things. One I thought was really interesting because I used to work in finance before this, and you talk about creating a taxable event when you start giving revenue or you start giving shares to your yeah. employees, but you talk, started talking about a profit interest unit which only takes advantage of the upside, and Correct. this was, I, I, as soon as I saw that, I told the other guys in my company, I was like, we have to watch this, I want you guys to watch this video because yeah. it's a very creative way to do this. Can you talk about how you incentivize your other executives using prop, profit interest units? So I, I, I think of it like, in the one word that I love is alignment, right? Mm -hmm. Like this business is a boat, we're all in the boat, it's real important, we're all rowing in the same direction. And so you have to be able to share your wins. And so what I do with executives is I give them equity, but what you're talking about is the way that I structure the equity that I give them. And, and you know, if someone comes into the business and say I give them a half a percent of the company, right? 0.5 equity. 
one, I'm going to get a current valuation for what the business is worth today. And, um, and that valuation is going to be the threshold. And so, for example, if the business is worth uh, $10 million, right? Each, each point of the business, each 1% would be $100,000. If you enter the business at $100,000, and I'll use one point for, for round, round numbers, then the threshold of the equity that I'm going to give you is, is $100,000. I created this company with those people mm. that's worth $10 million. You just got here. Like, you're not getting any of that. You're going to get credit for where you help take this business to. And so then if during your tenure in the company, we, we double down and we increase revenue, top line, we keep bottom line under control, we have good margin management, and, you know, we get to X amount of EBITDA, and then we end up transacting at a multiple that, that deems this business enterprise valuation, say, $50 million. Well, now each 1% of that business is worth $500,000. And so when, when the transaction happens, when you sell a business, there's a, what, what they call a waterfall. And so the first money that always gets paid off is debt. Mm. How much money does the company owe, right? And then it goes to if there's pref equity, preferred equity. It's, it's a class of equity that stands in front of everyone else. Yeah. That's next. And so as it flows down the waterfall, it gets to that person's 1%. The, the first 100000 of that comes to the house. That comes to us because you weren't here for that. Yeah. We have to meet the threshold. And so then it, it kicks in essentially at that number and whatever the upside is. And so in those economics, yeah. it would be worth 500, but I'm getting the first 100, you're getting the 400, mm. right? And that works from a tax, uh, tax situation as well because if I just gave you straight equity, if I gave you a, a point of equity on a business that's valued at $10 million, well, I just gave you something of value of $100,000. You're gonna have to report it and you're gonna have to pay taxes on it, but it's not liquid. Yeah. And in a private company, you can't borrow against it. And yeah. so I might hurt you essentially uh, financially by giving this to you because I'm gonna create a taxable event. And so it also helps that way as well. And a lot of times where employees might be like, well, what do you mean there's a threshold? And I'm like, all right, well, I'll remove the threshold. You ready to give the government $50,000 this year? They're like, no. I'm like, that's my point. Like, So they don't actually receive shares in the company, but they also don't have to participate in the downside either. They only participate in the upside. That's right, yeah. yeah it's, so, also, it's also it's non-voting hmm. and doesn't- It's, it's almost like a stock, you're, you, they've got a call option. It's, it pretty much, like, yeah. yeah. And they don't get distributions as well. Cash distributions along the way doesn't go to them. You could structure, you could add that, but in this structure, it did not. It was really about getting them aligned to get the thing over the finish line to sell it. Yeah, the alignment and the incentivization for yeah. sure. I take all my sales guys to to Jamaica with me with like 150 girls for uh, Paradise Challenge. God bless. They are, uh, they are aligned. We're aligned in the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have the same mission. We have the same mission there. <laughs> it works out really well. Uh, so this is something I really want you to expound on. You are about to sell part of one of your companies for $40 million and then you find out oh, that God. one, yeah. you find out that one of your executives was a DEA informant. Can you talk about like what happened there? It was crazy. Yeah. Um, he was, he was uh, one of my closest friends, former NFL player, 6'7", played for the Giants, uh, played for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. He, in a game, had a career-ending injury that resulted in a spinal fusion. He got spun out on pain meds, uh, went into addiction, got sober, uh, and entered the addiction treatment industry where I met him. And huge personality, funny as shit. If you met him today, you would love him, honestly. Yeah. And... Um, and he came to work for me in 2014, his first job. I think I paid him 40 grand a year. And we worked together building this business. And my brain was spinning. I was like, oh, is this Mark Bavaro? Well, who is this Carl Banks? Like I was trying to figure out who was playing for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and the, and the Giants. Anyway, go ahead. He, um, in 2019, uh, I, I, you know, I've been politically active on the issue of addiction. Yes. I testified to the United States Senate in yes. 2015, which was a great honor. You know, uh, I'm, I'm so grateful for that opportunity. But what that did was put me in front of a lot of politicians, the highest level politicians. And so uh, Mike Pence called me in 2019 and said he wanted to address uh, the opioid and addiction crisis. And he'd like to come to New Hampshire and do it from my facility. And would I be down for that, essentially? And I said, well, sure. Yeah, sounds great. Crazy situation, 300 people sitting in my event center, part of my corporate headquarters, the who's who of New England, the vice president's coming. 
20 minutes before the vice president is wa- supposed to be there and walk out onto stage with me, um, they canceled the event. Mm. And three weeks later, we don't know why. Donald Trump is on the lawn of the White House going, you know, it's uh, it wasn't a matter of national security. <laughs> there was a problem. You can Google this and find this clip somewhere. You know, there was a problem. They were questioning him, why did Mike Pence cancel his visit? These guys never changed their schedule, especially yeah. last minute, unless something real shit happened. You know, uh, there was a problem at the site. Brother, I'm like a fucking lifelong criminal. Yeah. I'm at my house wrapped in like a tinfoil suit with like an AR. Like, what do you mean there's a problem at the site? I'm the fucking site. Yeah. And so three weeks later, uh, my guy says, come into my on a Monday morning, says, come into my office. I'm like, what's up? He's like, hey, um, I relapsed in 2017. I got involved with the girl who got me involved with the drug dealer. I picked up drugs for him. The feds busted him. The feds busted me. And I've been working with the, the DEA for the last two years. Mm. And the DEA tips, tips Secret Service off. And that's why the vice president canceled because they didn't want him in the building with me, a, a drug dealer, and, and an undercover informant. And I'm like sitting on the chair in his office looking at him like, Dude, I gave him an I gave him a medallion for 13 years of sobriety like 3 months before this. Like he lived a total double life. Wow. In front of 100 people. Yay, congrats on being sober. Like he was not he had not been sober. Like yeah. the whole thing was a facade. And I'm looking at him like, "What are you talking about?" He's like, "Because because uh because of the vice president and all that, the feds made me plead guilty to a charge in federal court last Thursday." And I just want to let you know that they unsealed those documents and fed it to the media. And any minute now, it's about to be a, a, a media frenzy. Yeah. And I, dude, it's like 10 o'clock in the morning on Monday in July. And I'm like, w- w- like it's a lot of information to take in. Of course. I, I looked at him. I was like, bro, let, let's just get out of the building. Let's get out of here. Let's figure this out. By the time I made it to my house... I had Fox News, CNN, MSNBC. I had every Politico. I had every major news person blowing my phone up, parked in front of my house. Like, it was crazy. And and I had been in a process. I took my, I'd taken my company to market to sell it. And I, everything works out for crazy, bro. Yes. Like, this is what's, the wildest thing about the story is how it ended up working out. And so I'm about, I'm nine days away from closing a transaction that I'm selling 80% of my business at a $50 million valuation. I'm getting a check for 40 million bucks, which is a lot of dough. And, um, and I'm, I'm talking to PR people. I'm talking to my lawyers. I'm talking, you know, and I'm like, I had nothing to do with this. This is just a crazy once in a lifetime situation. Yeah. The buyer private equity company calls me up at like three o'clock in the afternoon. And this is how the conversation went. I went, Hey. And he, they went, hey, we're out. I was like, I understand. And they just hung up. Yeah. And that was the last I ever spoke to him. And the deal was blown up. You know, I play, I've play. i played fastball frequently. I, I had owed the IRS a couple million bucks. Yeah. I was going to pay him at the closing table. Like, I, it, it, was, it was a rough go, dude. It was a rough go. And, uh, but everything worked out. I ended up selling the business for... More than double that. More than double that. How much, how much longer down the, the line? That happened in the summer of 2019, and I sold in December of 2021. So the first so valuation two was years 50, later. Yeah, wow. two, 50 million, and then I doubled. I just went to work. I just said, you know what? Enough of the bullshit. I'm going to put my head down. I'm going to take the business off the market. I'm going to focus on it. And I increased operational efficiencies. I increased sales. I, I professionalized the business. I did. I just went to work for two years, took it to market, and you know it was more than two turns of the valuation. So the valuation was fifty million dollars, and we when we sold it, we sold it at an enterprise valuation of one hundred and fifteen. That's incredible. So this yeah. ended up being a blessing. The other thing, I'm, it didn't feel like a blessing right, at, the, at time. the time. Yeah. yeah, but it felt, but it ended up being a blessing Listen, in disguise. Sometimes when your girl leaves you, it's a blessing. And you, yeah, just don't, yeah. you don't realize, you don't realize it till you, till you see her new boyfriend is uh, is broke and getting cucked, and then uh, you know you, you have a beautiful girlfriend. <laughs> Not speaking from experience or anything. Sorry about that. Sorry, that was a little personal. Um, the the thing that I thought was amazing. What, 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 one of the things, the first thing I thought was. Okay, you are a, a recovering addict, yeah. right? And the fact that other addicts would work for you is not shocking to me. No. And the fact that one of them would get busted for something like that. Like, I can see if this was Charles Schwab, this is a problem. 
I think for your business, I felt like I feel like this was Dude, kind it, of it, it. It honestly, it wouldn't have been an issue. Yeah, if you didn't have former NFL player, vice president of America. Yes, if this is just some guy who's in recovery, and it happened in the business, like it wouldn't have even made the local news. Yeah. It was really supercharged by the vice president and the fact that he was this former NFL player made it even sexier. The yeah. most accurate media that was done on this and the only interview I participated in was covered by Sports Illustrated. Isn't and they did and the writer there the writer there did I will give him credit. I was skeptical. He did an amazing job covering it. Isn't it interesting? Like it 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 seems like it's a little bit more work, but I I, I just did uh twenty twenty a couple weeks ago. Uh, oh, nice. one of the girls that I interviewed on the red carpet at Babes and Toyland murdered her sugar daddy. And the story was, she, she just, yeah, I know. Her and her boyfriend, who both murdered the sugar daddy, the guy had given, given her 700 grand. Uh, the, the story was, Playmate murders sugar daddy. And I'm being interviewed by 2020, and I'm like, hey, guys, you know she's not a, a Playmate. She paid for that cover in Playboy Italia in 2017. Her sugar daddy literally paid for the cover. <laughs> she, is, she isn't a real play. She's not even nude in the magazine. They're just doing a Q&A. And Dana was like, no, 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 no. Playmate yeah. murders her sugar daddy. And I was like... All right, man, I guess this is more interesting to you to yeah. do it like this. So I just thought it was interesting. Like, it is a little harder to get the story right. And a it lot is. of times, a, lot, a little bit less interesting. But I, I'm always the same. It's the same thing. I'll just bring it back to this. Uh, this the, the news publications that were saying Andrew Tate was arrested because he ordered a pizza in Romania. And it was like, no, he has a passport. He came into the country. They knew he was in the country. He literally posted he was in the country. And anyone who, who said that, I was like, okay, this is not credible news. And so I just thought it was interesting when you yeah. say that because a lot of times it's just so much easier to post the lascivious stuff. So for you, former NFL player gets caught in a DEA sting, vice president is easier than finding out the actual the headline information. headline was like repetitively, vice president Mike Pence cancels a uh, visit to New Hampshire to avoid shaking hands with drug dealer. Yeah. And like, bro, the guy, the guy wasn't even a drug dealer. Like, yeah. They, he, he had, he was himself in a relapse. No one knew it lasted, I think about a year and his drug dealer would be like, Hey, go pick up the package. And he'd be like, okay. And he'd go pick up the package. Like he literally just went and picked up the drugs and drove it to the drug dealer, which is bad. And you shouldn't have done that. Sure. It's illegal, but it's not like they made it sound like he was like the kingpin. He was like. The cover up kingpin working at the drug rehab, yeah. pretending to be in recovery and distributing mass narcotics. Like, no, he was just a dumb fuck that drove the car with the package in it and yeah. the feds happened to be watching. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it wasn't really even that. Se like, if you heard the actual details, it wasn't sexy at all. Well, I would imagine other addicts, former addicts or former drug dealers have changed their life and gone to work at a facility. You're not the only one to do that. I have two other friends. Every, all of them. Yes, all every, of them. Every single facility, without exception, has people in recovery with shady pasts. That work there. Colorful pasts. So I don't know who there. Mike Pence thinks he's going to shake hands with. Well, uh, wait, wait, wait. You know, yeah. I got to tell you this. So a little bit of time goes by, and in, in 2021, uh, he comes to New Hampshire and does a fundraiser. And his his office calls me and says, Eric, Mike, Mike, Vice President Pence would like to meet with you. Yeah. And uh, I said, really? He said, yeah. Would you would you come to this VIP event prior to his speaking thing at this fundraiser in Manchester, New Hampshire? And it was me and like, I forget who was there, like a United States senator for the state, and like just a couple other people. And I met him and he came in and shook my hand and said, uh, "What he, he said, you're a real trooper. You really went with the punches on that one. Yeah. I said, yeah, thanks. Yeah. You know, yeah, it was a real trooper. Yeah. And uh, he said, you know, uh, my team probably overreacted on that. And he actually said, sorry, he apologized. Yeah. And I was like, cool, appreciate it. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, that's the other thing. Uh, the other people that I know that run rehab clinics were both addicts. Yeah. You know, and they've done really well. So, like, it just seems like this is... You know, normally, if I want to learn how to do a job, I go take an internship in that field, right? I, I become a paralegal to then yeah, become yeah, a, an yeah. attorney. This is one of the things where you are uh, an addict and then you start running a rehab clinic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it seems yeah. to be... It's, you know. it's certainly unique to this business. I mean, you don't have to be a dog to be a veterinarian. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, But here, it's mostly guys like me that run the, run, yeah. the, run the industry. What caused you to testify in front of the Senate? How did that come about? 
Fentanyl shows up in 2012. Um, I say this, and I don't know that it really hits as hard because it sounds dramatic, but all my friends die mm. over the course of a couple of years. I look back and I, I can envision I'm 16 years old. I'm at my dad's house. I have a party. There's 50, 75, 100 kids there, you know, and I'm walking through the, the backyard. We've got the speakers and the kegs and the, the girls and the drugs and all this stuff. And as I go through that memory in my mind, 98% of the people in that real memory are no longer with yeah. us. Like the entire party is fucking dead. And I watched that happen from 2012 on. And it was really heavy the first couple of years. Because mm. you had people that have been doing dope for a long ass time. And all of a sudden fentanyl shows up and kills them. And, uh, and it just rocked me, bro. I was, I was suffering with so much grief going to a couple funerals a week uh, that I started calling politicians. And I was like, something has to change. Like this fentanyl shit is killing everyone. And it was before it even hit the news. Like it was wild. And so I called this one senator, Kelly Ayotte, United States Senator out of New Hampshire. And she, uh, and I, I, I called and then I sent an email and then they followed up with me the next day. And the next week she came and visited my facility and we immediately started a friendship and a relationship. I'm still friends with her today. And uh, she came and visited my facility and then visited another one and then would call me and, Eric, what do you think about this? And, Eric, what do you think about that? And this and that. And then she called me up one day as I'd been kind of an advisor to her on yeah. the issue of addiction and drugs and fentanyl and recovery. And she said, how would you like to come to D.C. and, and testify uh, in, to the United States Senate on the opioid and addiction crisis in America? I said, I'd be honored. I'll be there. And so on my ninth... Uh, my ninth anniversary of sobriety, December 7th of 2015, uh, I testified there. We had a war on drugs in this country in the <laughs> late 80s, early 90s, and it didn't, still do. didn't fucking work. So it still just, isn't working. Yeah, it still isn't working. Yeah. Uh, what would your, all of a sudden you have fiat over the DEA and uh, in the Department of Defense. What do you do to change this specific issue? Because I imagine you put fentanyl ahead of these other drugs right now because it's killing people so quickly. The first thing I do is I tackle fentanyl. You know, the idea that we're the most powerful country in the world uh, and we can't stop drugs from coming over our border if we wanted to. If there was any health care, 111,000 Americans died last year of fentanyl overdoses. Mm. If 111,000 people died of any other reason uh, in America, like we would deploy every resource that we have. Do you yeah. remember what's that disease they had in Africa where you bleed out of your eyes? Uh, 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 Ebola. Remember when like there was like a threat of Crazy. Ebola? Do you remember what happened? They they like send all the money to stop the Ebola. There yeah. wasn't there was like one case or something, yeah. you know. And so, it, you know, it would certainly have a lot more attention, and I think we could stop doing as much damage as that we were doing. This is going to sound radical, but the the next thing I do is. I totally legalize all drugs. Yes. I eradicate the black market. I eradicate drug dealing. I, I, you want to attack the cartels? Ruin their business. I, I remove the prohibition mindset around all controlled substances. Um, in that, the reasons that will never happen in this country is that we have the funding of the war on drugs across the board and how many people and jobs depend upon that. You have a privatized federal prison uh, system that 85 percent of their their incarcerated population are nonviolent drug offenders they trade stock on wall street uh and they sell slave labor by incarcerated people the prison I mean, industrial complex yeah yeah and there's just a lot of seedy stuff that is tied like like who benefits yeah who benefits to drugs being illegal a lot of people a lot of people who benefits to if you legalized all of them a lot of people lose jobs. A lot of a lot yeah. changes, and so you know, for those reasons, I don't think we'll ever see it happen in this country. But well, you would see some sort of regulated use of these drugs in certain areas. Safe injection sites, so regulated like, 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 regulated like, drug use. So from the wire, like Amsterdam, from the wire. Did you ever watch the wire? I, I yeah. I've watched I've watched the wire season one to five or six, yeah. whatever the last one was, in, yeah. in concurrent order three times. Yeah. I love that show. Yeah, it's incredible. And I don't even watch TV, yeah. uh, but I love that show. And it's a real, it's a real description of what street life is Eat like. All the way up to the mayor. All the yeah. way. The entire. It, it, I mean, it really illustrates the whole game. 
Yeah. I mean, it does a fantastic job at that. I don't think that's what it looks like. I think it looks more like uh, Portugal and some of these countries over in Europe that have already taken this approach. Mm. They've gotten overdose death down to zero. Incredible. Zero. And so, you know, the prisons are emptied. And so it becomes a public health crisis. It becomes a health care issue. That's what I would do. Yeah, that's incredible. That's, a, that's actually what I thought you were going to say. Because yeah. when I talk to people on this side of it, that tends to be what their answer is, the legalization. Well, no, I mean, it, let me ask all the listeners, if we legalize heroin and crack cocaine today and put it at fucking Walmart, are you going to go get in line and buy heroin? Yeah. And use? No. Like, well, you're not going to be like, I've been really waiting for this to be legal, yeah. you know? Like, and so uh, prohibition doesn't actually stop anyone from using drugs. Well, well let's look at it the other way. Uh, about 40% of Americans had, had tried marijuana at one point or another. And if you listen to the people who were trying to pass the legislation to make marijuana legal, what they believed was as soon as it became legal, 100% of Americans were going to use marijuana. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, want to yeah, know yeah. what happened? 40% of people are still <laughs> using marijuana. It didn't make the use rate go up. This is in, this is conclusive proof that if you were to legalize this, I know it sounds horrible, but like more people wouldn't be doing coke. No. People, people can get coke now. I live in Vegas. Believe it or not, people can get coke here. And and the thing I is, I was twelve years old and I knew where to buy heroin exactly. and coke. That's, like access. The thing is that the prohibition mentality, the false narrative and belief system is that is limited access to drugs. Access is not limited. We if you want drugs, you're going to have them the yes. same day. No matter what, yeah. you could be in rural America or Las Vegas or Miami where I live, you're getting them. But when you take drugs and you put them into white walls, stainless steel, you know, stuff with nurses and scrubs and you come in, this is where you get it. It just it turns it into like heroin addiction gets away from gangster rap and, and you know, escalates on 24s and becomes more like schizophrenia and mental health. It, it, it takes us the sex appeal right out of yeah. it. Yeah. You know, it's no longer cool. Agreed. I, that, that's what I thought was going to happen, too, is once it became legal, you're going to stop seeing like Becky in college trying to start take it to piss off dad. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, the, this is fantastic. Uh, so this podcast is mainly about evolutionary psychology. It's one of the main topics I have. And you had a discussion about evolution, but it had to do with the rats. And I thought it was a yeah. really interesting corollary. Can you go over the, the rat experiment and then rat park? Yeah. So, um, a, a gentleman, a social scientist named Bruce Alexander, uh, who put out a book called The Globalization of Addiction, which if you're interested in this, uh, an amazing read, read that. He also wrote the preface to a book that I published in 2019, uh, is famous for uh, a study that he did in the early 90s. And so in the 80s and 90s, we a lot of the philosophy of how people think about addiction was derived from this one study, which was, and it was in all the all the books, all the, the college textbooks yes. in how we taught them. And it was, they took a rat and they put it into a science lab box and they introduced uh, regular drinking water and then they introduced uh, water that was infused with drugs. They ran it with heroin and they ran it with cocaine. In this study, the rat would try both it would get intoxicated from the drugs and then it would consistently go back and use the drugs. It would become addicted and it would always, always overdose and die. And so the takeaway from that is that heroin and cocaine are bad substances. They are the problem. We must remove the substance. This is all the thinking that, that sure. really spun Very out Very binary. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and the substance is the issue. Bruce Alexander comes around and says, wait a minute, we, well, one of the things we did not take into account here uh, is the environment the rat is in. And so he builds Rat Park, which is this enormous rat cage. He has wood chips and, uh, you know, <sighs> aluminum cans and food and male rats and female. It's like it's like heaven on earth for rats. And, uh, and he introduces the drugged water and the drinking water to this rat community. The rats try both. They occasionally use the drugged water because they like to party, but no drugs, no rats become addicted to drugs and no rats overdose and die yeah. in Rat Park in this this better environment. More interestingly, they take uh, a rat, they get it addicted in the isolated box, and then they introduce it to Rat Park. And in this environment, society, what does society think? Yeah, it's going to be, you can start robbing and stealing. Robbing and stealing, yeah. and, you know, this is not going to be good. The rat, knowing that it has access to the drugs that it needs to prevent withdrawal symptoms chooses to disengage from using the drugs and, and acclimates to becoming a part of the rat park community. 
And so, you know, when you, a lot of addiction is about environment and, uh, and, and by environment, it's really about this state of a stress response that we live in. Another interesting takeaway is that addiction globally doesn't show up until Western civilization does. Yeah. That, that tribes left in their, you know, un you know, untampered with methods and ways or whatever, um, they don't experience alcoholism. Yeah. There's a study as recent as the 1950s of a tribe in northern Canada uh, that had no history of alcoholism. Oil companies get interested in the land, they put them on reservations, uh, and once they disrupt their way of life, their traditions, their ceremonies, and all of that, alcoholism uh, runs rampant in yeah. the, in the, uh, in the community. Because they're ruining their park. Yeah. yeah. Uh, have you ever read about the opium wars between China and uh, the United Kingdom? Remind me. Um, that literally... The, the UK is selling opium to Chinese people. And the, the Chinese realize that it's just decimating their population. Yeah. And so they decide to make opium illegal. And the, the, the Brits are willing to go to war with China in order to make sure that, that heroin stays legal in that country. It's phenomenal. <laughs> Read about the story. And then that's, where, that that's where Hong Kong comes from. Hong Kong is like the settlement at the end of the war that stays part of the United Kingdom until 1997. So that's, that's essentially where it comes from. It's just amazing. Like They were making so much money off selling heroin to Chinese people that that's the reason why they went to war with them. Unbelievable. Yeah, the heroin wars. Um, so the, the, part, the reason why your story was so fascinating to me is because, again, let's go back to evolution. Narcotics don't exist in the ancestral environment. The, yep. we, we get to a point where... I know we have um, Native Americans who live in Peru who are chewing coca leaves. Yes, for, from that standpoint, yes, narcotics are in, in the environment. But for the most part, most ancestral homo sapiens before the uh, agricultural revolution are not taking heroin. They don't have access to these substances, right? Maybe yep. some, some like caffeinated substance. Maybe there's some small amount of it, but nothing like fentanyl. And so that part doesn't exist in the ancestral environment. What does exist in the ancestral environment is community and accomplishing goals and those things, the reward center from killing the meat or protecting the tribe or building the, the, the fortification or cooking the meat or doing whatever I can to protect this, this civilization that I have, because there's no written language, there's nothing. Those things, then I would get a reward uh, center in my brain, dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin, and then I would feel good because of it. And so the example that you give before, you're trying to hide, the, a lot of times this anxiety that you have, you're trying to hide it with the drugs. And the reality is one of the best books I've ever read on this is called Spark, and it talks about just walking for long distances causes the neurochemicals in your brain to rebalance mm -hmm. correctly. The ultimate pharmacist for you is you. Yeah. And so, the, the, which explains to what you're saying before. These rats, and by the way, rats are much older than humans. Rats are the, probably one of the original forms of uh, mammalian hominids, or I'm sorry, mammalian vertebrates that existed, uh, were rodents. And if you go back through their history, I'm sure this is how it worked for them. The ones that were breeding and going out and scurrying for food, your brain is going to reward you for that, not sitting in your basement shooting up heroin, right? And so that made, when you said the rat park thing, it made sense to me. One of the ways to get over addiction, and this is something you talk about, the gym helps, right? 100%. The books help, well, right? Being around community you're, helps. You're, you're, you're spot on. And I talk about this all the time, and I feel like the way that I articulate it might get lost on a lot of people, but you have to really reverse engineer who and what we are. Yeah. Right. We're tribal animals. We're meant to, to hunt fish, eat like, like walk and bare feet on God's earth. Like yes. there's a lot of stuff we're meant to do that we're not doing anymore. Yeah. And there's a lot of stuff that we were never really meant to do that we do all the time. Right. Like we designed these work weeks, we designed, and then it, it's all of that. And it's also, the loss of hope, right? I always talk about, um, I give this as an example. My grandfather worked in a steel mill. He bought a house in 1952. Yeah. He had a stay-at-home wife and he raised three sons and he had two acres of land and a home. He had the American dream, right? Show me a guy that can work in a steel mill or a construction job and buy a home, have a stay-at-home wife and raise three kids right now. You couldn't be a licensed plumber or electrician yeah. and do that, right? Like, you gotta, like, the, 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 the hope of the future for a lot of people is bleak, right? It's the haves and the have nots. Like that world has changed very much. And so all of that is directly tied to both mental health and addiction. And yeah. it's the one area that we don't go to, to look why, how do you profit off it? Yeah. That's the problem. If you're a big pharma, how do you make money on that? Yeah. Who's going to make money to do it? Ah, ignore that shit. Yeah. <laughs> Let's give him a pill. Yeah, when you come to the realization that your species existed as nomadic 
hunters yeah. for 300,000 years and hominids existed like that for 3 million years. But the agricultural revolution is only 11,700 years and the industrial revolution less than 300 years. Then you come to the realization, oh, the majority of our existence did not have Facebook. Yes. It did not have narcotics, <laughs> right? And it didn't have breast implants. Like it was a different existence. <laughs> and, and so now if we go back and say, if we weigh the two things, we're like, oh wait, this pre-ancestral, this prehistoric existence is way, weighs more. The answer is probably here. Yeah. And then you go to the gym. Yes, that's correct. The other thing is flirting with women, roughhousing with your guy friends, guys talking shit with each other. The, the thing in every society, the whole thing where guys are in the locker room talking shit about each other's mom, that has existed forever. forever. <laughs> that, was, that was centurions fighting for the Romans 2,000 years ago. Yeah. That has always existed. Making fun of the uh, other guys. Uh, there's a, one doctor who, who believes that has to do with weeding out narcissists in a, in a group. Is like you guys all make fun of each other to figure out who the, the psychopath is. And it's really interesting when you go back into our ancestral history to find the answers to these questions. Because the answer wasn't the cell phone, because the cell phone didn't exist in the ancestral environment, and the narcotics didn't exist in the ancestral environment. So, but the women did, and the, then the, and the hunting did, and the fishing did, and the, and the weightlifting did. So those, those things are the things that are usually the solution, yep. like the ancestral solution. One of the things I thought was terrific was you talking about making amends. Yep. So like now at this point, you're, when you're going through your recovery program, and I imagine this is something you do with people who go through your recovery program now, yep. is the idea of anyone who has hurt you at all, you have to go back to them and make amends. Can you talk about that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's hard to get right with God and get right with yourself without getting right with his kids and other people here, right? And so we, we all carry these things with us, this baggage. This, And before making amends, we deal with resentment, the people we hate. We deal with fear. We deal with selfishness, dishonesty, you know, all of these kind of internal soul problems. We do a lot of work around those things. But part of the recovery process is writing out a list of everyone you've ever hurt. And then one by one, we go to see them. And there's a couple rules that we use around that. One, uh, we, we make amends regardless of the personal consequence. Because, mm. you know, first they're like, well, I can't do that. I might go to prison or I can't do that. I, you know, but sorry, Papa. Because you got to snitch on yourself sometimes. Sometimes, All the time. sometimes yeah. she didn't know. Sometimes she didn't know you were cheating on her, and sometimes they didn't know you stole. Well, from that, her. well, th that's a little different, right? I've walked into Walmart, Home Depot, and every other store, you know, that I stole from, and looked the manager in the face and said, "I robbed you blind. I'm here to make it right." The other rule that we have is we don't make amends when to do so would hurt other people, mm. and so. I, I wouldn't advise a man to get that has had infidelity to go tell his wife, hey, I cheated on you because you're going to hurt her. You're going to to save yeah. your own skin. That one, maybe not. That one, we make the amends by changing the behavior. Just stop cheating on her. Just, yeah. just don't ever do that again. Yeah. And so, um, I, I, so I got after it, right? I, I made amends from stores I stole from. I made amends to people I was violent to. I made amends to drug dealers I robbed. I yeah. made amends like... To my family, I made yeah. amends to friends. I made amends to people I stole from. I mean, the, it was, you know, it was, it was, it was. I, if I had to pick one thing that that transformed my life more than any other one thing, it was that process. And that's where the ultimate honesty came from. Yeah, yeah. and and the ultimate transformation. Uh, you know, it was you know having those conversations and look at people in the eye and knocking on their door and saying, you know. Hey, I hurt you, and I'm here to make that wrong. I, I'm here to make that right. Rather, yeah. excuse me. Uh, it was just incredibly powerful. Uh, two of the stories I loved was one: you went to Walmart, and they and they called you later, and you taught them all the scams that other people were using yeah. to steal from them. Yeah, Can you yeah, talk yeah. about some of those? Yeah, no, I walked into Walmart, and um, and I made the amend, and you know the manager was like this big woman, and she was just staring at me, like kind of taken back, and she looked at me and said. So I, hold on, I need to go get security. I was like, oh shit, I knew it, I'm going to jail, you know? And she went and got security and that guy came and, and he was like, I don't, you know, thank you. I don't really know, I can't take your money. We have no way to enter it into the system. Like we sell things here in some yeah. major corporation. I can't just take your money. And uh, I said, well, listen, if there's any, I left my information, if there's anything I can do to help, please, you know, uh, um, I'll do anything I can. Yeah. So he calls me up and says, hey, we want you to come down to a meeting uh, with the security team. I said, okay. So I went down there and, and I, I ended up being a part of that team for like a couple of years. 
every once in a while they'd come in and ask me questions on you know how addicts were you know they were mind blown i was like you guys are so fucking dumb you know that if you go take those electric toothbrushes off that shelf right there and literally walk it to customer service right there i can return the shit I used to do the electric toothbrush. They're like 120 bucks or something at the time. Yeah. And I would take like four of them. I wouldn't have a receipt. I wouldn't even have a Walmart bag. I would literally just be strung out and out of my mind, rolling up to customer service with shit I just took off the shelf. And I'd put it down and I'd be like, yeah. yeah, I need to return this. I got them as gifts. Yeah. And they would give me gift cards. And I would sell the gift cards for like 50 cents on the dollar. Half the time, I'd have the dope man waiting in the parking lot. And he would take the gift cards for 50 cents on the dollar. Yeah. And so, you know, they were just mind blown. They're like, and so that whole thing changed. And, you know, Kansas Infamil, you know, the security, I was like, you guys, gonna, you, you know, the Infamil and the razor blades, we sell them at the bodegas in the hood. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so was, I taught them all about that stuff. And the one where you put several flat screens on a, on a pallet and just walk out of the store. I used to do it. that shit all the time. Yeah. So I'm saying, I'd be so out of my mind. I'd, I'd get one of those flat, you know, yeah. roll away things. And, uh, and this is when a flat screen TV was actually worth something. Yeah. Now they're a couple hundred bucks. But back then, it was a big ticket item. And I'd stack that bitch like this high with TVs. All right. So the, the other one uh, where you made amends that I thought was really interesting is that you and some, uh, some guys go to rob some other drug dealers. And in doing so, going in there, one of them has a pistol. Yeah. Uh, ends, ends up shooting a, a couple of the guys, and then you end up making amends with that guy later. Can you talk about that whole deal? Yeah, it was a crazy day. You know, we, uh, we were... My creed on the street was I was a predator of predators, right? Like, I don't, I didn't. Like Omar from The Wire. Only ro drug dealer robs drug dealers. Yeah, man. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it, it's, we didn't live by society's rules, but we had our own and we, we were very serious about them. And so these guys had robbed a place for a safe and taken a bunch of money. We set them up. And, you know, when we got there, I robbed one of them with my friend and we took his chain and ran his pockets. And when I came out of the bedroom that we had taken him in to rob him, my other friends had the other guy held up and and they uh my friend justin went out and took his chain and they got in a little scrap and uh and he grabbed him by his head and smashed his head into the sheetrock and when he did that the kid pulled out a pistol and shot my friend in the chest and i was standing right next to him and uh and he started spraying shots he ended up shooting his own friend through the hand shot him straight through the hand shot my friend in the chest went in here came out the back we went running I, I came out the front door. My friend that just got shot went left. I went right. He started shooting at me. I stopped, put my hands up. I was like, yo, bro. Like, I don't even remember what I was saying. Yeah. Like, chill. Like, you're like, it ain't that serious. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, we don't, we don't, nobody needs to die today type of shit. You don't want to go to prison. And uh, he came up and he was wild. He was foaming at the mouth, like, it, screaming. He put the gun on my forehead and made me get on my knees. Yeah. And uh, I thought I was going to die. And my friend Justin, solid as shit, just got shot in his chest, comes back around, comes around the corner and lets off a, ski you! And the homeboy takes the gun off my head, points it at him and fires his last shot. Boom! Yeah. Click, click, click. And I was like, oof, I take off running. The other, I'm like, I don't even, I'm out. You yeah. know what I mean? I jump off this rock wall, I sprain my ankle. I'm like, you know, we end up catching the kid, the other kid, and, and he got his head punched in and got his face caved in, really. He had to get reconstructive surgery. And um, that kid ended up, we, we you know, we were, we were bad dudes back then. And so we went up and I, I took my friend that just got shot up to my friend's uh, mom's place, who was kind of like a little mafioso, you know, but she was a nurse. And so I had him laid out on her kitchen table using a bottle of whiskey to clean him out and her nursing tools. And she stitched him up. And we went and got a couple of handguns out of the stash and we went house to house where we thought this kid was going to be yeah banging down doors pushing our way into places like yo where's he at yeah and the plan i don't even know what the plan was I'm pretty sure the plan was just shoot on site when we find this kid yeah. he just tried to kill us you know and um thank god we didn't find him and this kid gets so scared after two days of me and my psychotic friends looking for this kid that he goes and turns himself in he walks into the police station and said, there's a crazy thing that happened. And I shot a couple of guys and, and they lock him up and he goes and does six years for it. Wow. Does six. And, uh, I don't testify. My friends don't testify. They come, they question the shit out of us. My friend's still, my friend's still bleeding out of his chest as we get taken in together. And they're like, we heard you got shot. He's like, nah, <laughs> like all God <gossed> stuff. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I don't know what you're talking about. They're like, you're literally shot in your chest. He's like, nah, <laughs> so funny. But, um, 
and he gets out and uh and you know it, through the recovery work in that time i get sober things go bad for me and then they get good and i get sober and i do all this work because in my head the whole time i'm like i still owe this kid like i'm gonna get you when i get you i'll see you on the other side yeah. like i don't care if it's 10 years from now bet it's on and um and my friend dies and there's uh uh, I, I go through the recovery stuff. I find forgiveness. My perspective changes. I see, I went from thinking that this guy tried to kill me and I should get him to, wow, I really put this guy in a bad position. Yeah. He started shooting because he was scared for his life. It cost him six years. Who know, You know, like uh, I start to take accountability. Like, fuck, this thing's kind of on me. The whole robbery was my idea. I'm yeah. going to set the whole thing up. I feel bad for him. Like, I owe this dude amends. I remember the light bulb that went off. I was like, I can't believe I have to make amends to this guy. This is crazy. Yeah. Tried to kill me. I was going to kill him. And um, and he comes, you know, I go, my friend dies, and they have this big bonfire after the funeral, and I'm standing around it, and uh, I'm actually walking up to it, and there's a bunch of people standing around it, and I kind of slide in, and it's all shadows, and I come in between two people, and I look to my right, and it's him. And we just lock eyes. And I'm like, hey, man, can I talk to you? And I put my hands up, like, just body language. Can we talk? He's like, yeah, we can talk. And we walked off, and I made my amends. You know, and I took accountability for the situation, told him I was wrong and, and whatnot. And he took accountability for his side as well. And, uh, and it was really powerful, and we, were, we became free. Late, some years later, I see him, I run into him. Uh, in a really bad neighborhood uh, that is a drug neighborhood up there where I'm from, and he's clearly having a hard time in life uh, on drugs, and I rolled up on him and, and had the opportunity to be a part of his recovery journey and help him get help and, like, still stay in touch with him here and there. And, uh, you know, it was the whole thing just came full circle. Yeah, that's yeah. that's that's really, really powerful. Um, from that standpoint, you know, just think about the situation, um, you know, when you had OD'd that one time, and you go back to make amends because you had punched one of the nurses in the face. Yeah. <laughs> and you talk to the... Uh, what a shit show my life was. <laughs> God. You punch one of the nurses in the face, you go back to make amends there. Yeah. And one of the nurses said something to you to the effect of people like you usually don't get better. And so, they started crying. Yeah, yeah. I OD four times in, in a couple months during the summer. And I just have no will to live, dude. Like, I want to die. Like, at the time, this is a real story. I'm mixing up so much heroin in the needle and putting it in my arm that other junkies are looking at me going, dude, like, don't do that much. That could kill you. <laughs> and I'm looking at him like a psychopath. And I'm like, it fucking might. And yeah. I'm pushing the plunger in. And, uh, and you know, that didn't work out a bunch. I ended up overdosing four times. And all four times, I wake up in this hospital on life support. I got breathing tubes. I got IVs coming on my arm, my neck. And, uh, and I'm just wild. Like, I'm not grateful to be alive. I wish I had died. I'm ripping the shit out. One time, you remember the story, they had me on this held down. And uh, what actually happened was they, I woke up from the Narcan just in time for them to stuff a catheter in my dick. And, uh, and I got my right hand loose and I knocked this nurse, male nurse. And uh, that's why I punched him, though, which I felt was kind of justifiable. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I didn't even know what was going on. But... But nonetheless, I would get up, I would torture this place. I go back and make amends, and uh, and the woman who runs the emergency room brings me to a back conference room and sits down. She has no idea why I'm there. Yeah. She's like, what can, what can I help you with? And I said, um, you know, my name's Eric Spofford, and I tell her the story. I said, one summer I ended up in here four times. I hit a nurse. I was running around your nurse's station with a Johnny naked. I ran out of here. I AMA'd, again, left against medical advice all four times. I terrorized this poor place. And she starts crying. And I'm like, why are you crying? And she looks at me and says a couple things. She says, Eric, I remember you. And when you stopped coming back, we thought you were dead. And she said, I can't believe you're in front of me right now. The amount of people that we see that are addicts is unbelievable. And I've never seen one get better before. And she says that, and I just start crying. And here we are in this room hugging and, you know, I tell I asked her, the cool part about that was I asked her what I could do to make it right. And she took my phone number and said, when we get a drug addict in here, for whatever reason, we'd like you to be able to call you and have you come down and talk to them. And I saw, I couldn't tell you how many people I was on their bedside in that emergency room mm. over years and uh, meet with them, you know? So it's not, it's not just that you got better. 
It's that you also got better and then sold your business for $115 <laughs> million. Dollars. Yeah, that's right. So there's the other thing, right? Um, uh, I've had some, some positive financial things happen in my life, but not $100 million. So I'm yeah. just curious, what is that like for you? How does that change? And then do you reflect on the fact that you, know, you try to stab a kid with a butcher knife and now you just sold your company for $100 million? How does that change your life, your mentality? Or does it change nothing at all? What, what is it like? I heard a saying that I really like. It's not mine, but but it, it hit me hard and it said money didn't really change me, but it changed a lot of people and a lot of things around me. Mm. And um, you know, maybe this is a course. I don't want to do it, but someone could about like how do you adjust to wealth? Yeah, because it its tentacles are long and wide. And when you come from nothing and then you get to the, it's a long journey to get there. But you know, and so it, it I don't know. It was kind of anticlimactic. I can tell you that I don't feel any differently. Yeah. But, but I can walk into a room and I can feel that people see me differently. Yeah. And I'm like, fuck, you know? And, um, and so, I don't know. I don't do anything differently, dude. I'm still up in, early in the morning. I'm still working hard. I'm still starting businesses, growing businesses, buying, doing real estate, building this, buying that, fixing that. You know, my day-to-day -day hasn't changed. Yeah. I bought a 92 foot boat. I might see the thing like every six weeks. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I, I just, I do what I love and not like not much has changed in that sense at all. When you meet people who are also very wealthy, this is something that I've been able to notice when they earned it and they used to be poor versus when they didn't earn it and yeah. they just inherited it. I see complete difference. I have a friend I of don't, mine. I don't, I don't, I don't, I notice that heavily. Yeah. Yeah. I actually don't think I've successfully relationships with people that didn't earn it yes like we're just too different i'm new money you're old money they yeah. look at me and they're like who let this fucking guy in yeah. you know what i mean like he's part of the club now yeah like yeah bitch i am what's up it's funny uh, i'm friends with um uh the guy who created the show full house uh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah i used yeah. to watch that show yeah, when i was a yeah, kid it's awesome he lives in florida yeah. and he used to be just a poor struggling you know pa who hit it on a, an incredible show and then now the guy's worth hundreds of millions of dollars and whenever i have conversations with him i can still see that this dude remembers when he used to be poor yeah. and that's why he has so much gratitude and i can hang out with him then i have some friends that are like come from rich oil money saudi arabian like and, and when you talk to them it's not that they're not cool it's just you Hell, there's something different yep. and it's almost like their interactions especially with women are they just deserve it and why isn't everyone else just rich like me do you understand what i'm saying and like so you can yeah. see the difference when they didn't come from money and when they did and when you have a conversation with them with it which also lends to the idea of like what do you do with your kids one of the favorite my favorite books is the millionaire next door uh and it goes over you know the best way to leave money to your kids if they're not working don't give them anything that kind of thing so I thought that was interesting. It's funny you said that. I actually have my trust and estate plan set up that it has a lot of rules in it. And that for people, you know, I have two children, two boys. And in order for them to be able to access it, and you know, there's different unlocks at different periods of time. But for life, they need to be working or yeah. in school full time to yeah. benefit it at all. And they're like, Eric, like I'm sitting with the estate attorney. And they're like, so if they're not doing these things, let them starve. Yeah. What if they call the trust of the person in charge of your estate and they're homeless? So I'm gonna get a fucking job. Yeah. Like, let them struggle. The thing I'm most grateful for life in life is my struggle. You know what I mean? Yes. And so, like, yeah, I'm not, I, I refuse to have spoiled little rich prick kids, you know, spending daddy's money, smoking a bong, driving a sports car. Like, yeah. No way. Problematic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one other thing I wanna ask you about is so you come from this situation where you were robbing and stealing and you, you had, uh, you were addicted to drugs and then you, now you're a coach. And I, I would assume you get some haters online. How do you deal with criticisms that you may get coming from where you came from and doing what you do now? Um, how do I deal with them? I don't really, I, now I just ignore it. Like I, now I'm just surrounded by winners and people winning and I've, I've dealt with haters. I, I'll say this. I dealt with haters more on the journey getting here yes. than I do now that I'm established and I'm here. Yeah. And that was a struggle. That was something to get used to. Um, but my perspective on it, that's actually a post from today on my Instagram that talk from a, a clip of a speaking event that I did. And I think haters are losers. Like I feel bad for them. Like yeah. I hope you do enough work to change that, that darkness in your soul. Yeah. Like, you know, no one winning ever hates on me. No one doing well ever 
hates on. But that is so. Man, Denzel Washington said that he goes, nobody ever is doing better than you is sitting there hating on you. And I was just, it's so true, man. Like it's always these. You and I find YouTube commenters to be like the bottom of the list uh, that that are just like they have no TikTok's avatar. TikTok's pretty bad. TikTok, too. no, you're right. TikTok, TikTok is really vicious, bad, bro. bro. If you post on TikTok something super negative where you criticize some gender or some like uh, some socioeconomic class, you will get nothing but positive comments. It's so weird. <laughs> and if you sit there and talk about I came up and did this and like I can help you, it's just nothing yeah, but like no. the lowest you're rungs of society. On. Society. It's so on Instagram because they know me. I think because they choose to follow yeah. me. I think it's a little different. But man, on YouTube, it's just crazy. crazy just like yeah. stuff. Compet- competitive uh, coaches who are like come my competition, they'll write their, their little peons will write shit on there. And it's so crazy to watch. But yeah, uh, my favorite one was um, David Goggins. He's running and he looks at the camera and he goes, hey to all you haters, just want to let you guys know you're the cockroaches. He goes, he used to work at Ecolabs. Like, he was an exterminator. He's like, I'm the peanut butter that you cockroaches I use as bait yeah. to, to bring you cockroaches out into the light so that I can stomp you. And I was like, whoa, man, that is a, a different way to look at it. And then you have like Dan Fleischman, he's just like, delete, block, delete, block. There's nothing else, there's no interaction whatsoever. I use it, I read haters' comments before I go to the gym. That's something that I've been doing for a while, <laughs> right before I go to the gym, dude, yeah. it's angry time. So that, that's definitely been helpful for me. Where can people find you, man? Where can people learn more Instagram's about you? Instagram's the best place, at Eric Spofford, I'm there. Uh, you know, ways to connect with me is in the links in my bio, check that out. Yeah. Yep, uh, spe- specific products are you doing now? Are you involved in a REIT or any kind of big real estate investments? What, 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 how, how would somebody get involved? In business? Yeah. Um, you know, I don't really have any opportunities for people to invest with me. I don't yeah. have any. I can tell you that I have operating companies in real estate and I have zero partners. Okay. Um, and I took all the proceeds from my liquidity event from the sale of the business and I've redeployed those into different verticals of real estate, multifamily, single family, commercial healthcare spaces. I've started another addiction treatment platform company. We mm. have the first facility operational and scaling census and we have the next four, the real estate under construction now. Uh, and do you have a coaching program? And I have a coaching program. Yeah, yeah. it's you know it's small. Um, I, I got a group of about fifty uh, people. Uh, I coach entrepreneurs in scaling businesses. Yeah. You know that's everything from six to seven, seven to eight. You know eight to nine even. Uh, but it's an amazing group, and I work with them all individually. We do some group coaching. We have some events. Uh, got a big mastermind event coming up in Miami. If you okay. want to come out, yeah, sixth and seventh. Our friend Dan Fleischman's one of my Beautiful. speakers. Wes Watson, another name that Wes came is up great, today. man. We're gonna do burpees on stage. Yeah, 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 hundred yes. percent. Yeah. And then uh, Jesse Lee and Sean Whelan also. I love it, Sean. Yeah. Awesome, so rockstar lineup. That's coming up uh, April sixth and seventh. For anyone, come out to Miami. Have a fun couple days. Okay, nice, man. Yes, sir. Awesome, man. Well, thank you for joining us, guys. Thank you guys for watching. Again, thank you for uh, two hundred thousand downloads on uh, Spotify and. Uh, Apple. That's crazy to me because I, I expected all the traffic to come from YouTube. So I want to say thank you. Thank you, Eric, for coming Absolutely. out here. I knew uh, it was awesome when I met met you and did some research and just an amazing story. And I'm glad you got to tell it. And I will see all the rest of you guys next week. Absolutely.